Hello there. General Kenobi. <laughs> You're keeping that in. You're keeping that bit in. Uh, yes, obviously. Um, so, yeah, um, I guess, uh, do you want to go ahead and introduce? Do you, do you want me yeah, to start let's, with, um, like, let's talk about, talking um, about my channel? Let's, or what, let's talk what, about Romeo first. And then I'll segue and talk about EUT. Okay. Welcome all to our first podcast episode. This is with Nadim Ahmad of Aran Udtoran. And this will be our first podcast of hopefully a monthly series. It should be available to patrons early on Patreon. And uh, it will be available on YouTube a week after instead of the usual month after. Um, so my name is Evan Schulteis. I'll be your host uh, with Nadim. Uh, uh, I'm part of the reenactment organization Romayos uh, Living History. Uh, Romayos is a living history group dedicated to reconstructing the various periods of the Roman Empire, both military, civilian, bureaucratic, religious, and other aspects from roughly the 1st century AD to the 15th century uh, AD. I guess, go ahead. Okay, that's my cue. All right, hello. Uh, my name is Nadim. Um, I run the um, Eron Turon group. We're based in the UK, and uh, we focus on Central Asia. Um, that is what is now um, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and, and the surrounding areas um, in late antiquity and the early medieval period. Um, currently focusing on the civilization of the Sogdians um, in the end of the 7th and start of the 8th centuries. All right, um... With that out of the way, I guess let's move on to discussing what we're going to talk about today. So, uh, today we'll be discussing the world of living history and reenactment. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about basically the field and how the field works, and also like the big challenges with being a reenactor, doing living history, um, and what reenactment and living history means to us both as interpreters of history and portrayers of reconstructed history. Like, so we're going to be discussing things like authenticity, interpretation, uh, working with academics, uh, the benefits of different size reenactment groups, uh, some of the issues with reenactment, like what draws people in, how to get a bigger crowd, how um, the question of perception and reenactment, um, and also where reenactment is going. So uh, the reason I brought Nadim in for this particular podcast is because Nadim is working in one of the most unique reenactment groups that faces some of the biggest challenges in the entire field uh, compared to, say, Viking reenactment or Principate Roman or anything along those lines, let alone something like Civil War, um, which I'm sure all of those will bring up. They're all relevant, but... In this particular case, uh, Nadim, as a reenactor of Central Asia, is focusing on a part of the world that most people tend not to think about, and that that has some very unique challenges, but also presents some very unique opportunities. So I guess we'll move into um, our first talking point with that, which is that reenactment is a large and varied field. So Nadim, why, what brought you into choosing reenactment? versus getting a degree in Central Asian history? Okay, that's actually a really good question. Uh, well, first of all, I just need, need to say, like, I, I'm not brave enough for academia at all. No way. Um, but so, so I go to reenactment as a hobby, and I think most people do. I think the academic stuff usually comes later. Um, and so what I really wanted to do when I started reenacting was um, basically cavalry skill at arms stuff. Um, and um, the, the specific circumstances got me into it. Cause, so initially, I'd seen reenactors around. Um, I, I assume a lot of extras on, on like TV documentaries and stuff are them. I'd seen them at shows before I even became aware of what reenactment was, but I sort of assumed they were paid actors. I didn't realize it was a thing that you could actually do and sign up and volunteer for um, until I got to university. And um, um, I got in, involved with the Archery Society at university, and there were a couple of guys there who were also part of the reenactment society. Um, which I then got involved with. But I didn't get any of my own gear. Um, for a couple of years after that, I was kind of just training, um, doing mounted skill at arms for, for a while. 
um, until a Roman group that had nearly newly formed at the stables I, I rode with were looking for riders, and they asked me because at that point I was actually fairly decent shooting the bow and arrow off of a off of a galloping horse. They asked me if I would be interested in um, getting some kit and doing some shows with them, and of course I jumped the idea. Um, I didn't want to do Roman stuff though, so at the time I said, "Yeah, this this, this is cool, but I'm not really interested in the Romans." Um, but I'll do some Sasanian stuff with you, and this is back in 2011, 2012. Um, got my first set of Sasanian gear at that point. And uh, basically since then, it's kind of just been down the rabbit hole. Um, my research interests have, have changed and life circumstances um, and personal circumstances would change the way that I approach um, reenacting. And in fact, nowadays, it's really less about um, doing stuff on horseback. Just because I don't have the time these days. Um, uh, and now it's more about um, finding out how were things back in the past and, and learning more about a culture. And and so actually Central Asia and Sogdiana is is not Sasani and Iran. And I got into it because the two cultures are often linked in in non-academic um, works. And and one of the first books that I had was uh, David Nicole's um, Sasanian Armies, which uh, is still it still you know holds up. I mean it's a little dated, but there's there's nothing inherently bad with it as a starting text. Um, but there's a couple of pages on there about um, Central Asia, and I'm like, this is really cool. So I like, you know, the more you research into it, the more I research into Central Asia, the more I was like, this is really cool. I want to do this, um, and then add that to the fact that actually, um, you know, w when you spend more time in reenacting. Um, some people, yeah, myself included, tend to aim for more historical accuracy. That is to say, we want to know more about the archaeological data, the art, um, written sources, etc. And the more I got into this, I found that actually getting sources for Sasanian Iran uh, for material culture was actually very difficult. Um, whereas on the other hand, um, if I just jumped a couple hundred miles north into Central Asia, finding all these sources is actually really easy. Um, because, um, well, a, lo a lot of it's um, hosted in the Hermitage, and there's very good pictures online, um, and most of it is published in Russian language journals, um, which uh, a lot of a lot of which you can just find PDFs of online, um, and the stuff that isn't published in in in, in Russian um, is published in Uzbek and Tajik, which use uh, Western alphabets, um, Latin or Cyrillic. So again, it's relatively easy to search for stuff uh, that way as well. Um, so I think just you know the ease of research and my own interest in the field kind of drew me towards towards Central Asia. Plus the reception I got from um, folks working in Central Asian um, studies as well, which is overwhelmingly positive when I started. Um, so yes, that is a very roundabout um, <laughs> roundabout story about how I got where I am now. So yeah, that it, it's it's a long journey, especially starting with horseback archery of all things that's normally a place where reenactors want to go where they're riding horses one day when they have they're rich and have infinite money uh rather than a place they usually start out out at so it's actually kind of interesting that you've gone the backwards direction in some respect from uh i guess we'll talk about the other reenactment groups in a little bit here but uh you've gone to focusing more on culture and the individual from the world of i guess wealthy military reenactment which in many respects is the improvement i guess many reenactors need to make uh maybe myself included but that that that's actually it's an interesting path that that evolved in because i remember you starting out because you started out at practically the same time i did so i remember you in the early days uh, when I was on Roman Army Talk as a moderator, and you were posting Sessanid stuff there. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, back when Roman Army Talk was an active place. Now, of course, uh, Aranud Turan is a very different. It's a very different group from most of what's out there. So you have what three members? <laughs> um, so it depends how you define group. To be honest with you, um, so uh, I, I like to look at it not not so much as as, as a proper group as opposed to uh, me plus assistants, and and I don't mean to like like sound arrogant here, um, but the reason I say this is because um, in a reenactment group, generally what happens, at least in the few groups I've guested with, I've done events around again, is what happens is is the lead can can he might not be there. 
Um, he might do another event. E even the second in command might, might not be there. But everybody else will have enough kit, knowledge, responsibility, whatever, to be able to hold the fort by themselves. And and so in in a in a group like like strictly speaking, I guess um, there's enough members there with enough quality kit and enough knowledge and enough safety and common sense to be able to hold the fort if the main guy disappears. And that's very much not the case with with what I do. So um, so yeah, th there's there, there's myself and there's two other guys who reenact with me. Um, but at the moment, I don't leave them uh, to do the events without me present. Um, now, that's likely to change in the future. Um, unfortunately, last year and this year has kind of put a massive pause button on the plans that I had, um, but and the plans that we all had, actually. But, uh, but yeah, my, my focus at the moment is getting my other two guys up to speed with, uh, with gear, and with historical knowledge and with sort of safety knowledge, which is actually probably the most important thing um, that often tends to go understated is, is how to deal with the logistics and the safety and, and, and whatever dealing around reenactment exhibition. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that, that's probably the difference between, between I guess, a, a proper group and, and what we do, um, where really I do tend to lead things myself um, quite, quite a bit, unfortunately. Um, yeah, but I will be handing that over um, soon. I intend to anyway. Yeah, and uh, I mean, on my end of things, I, Romeo's right now is just me. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, there's uh, even smaller than Arad on Toran. Okay. And, um, but yeah, uh, that is a similar approach that I intend to take where it, it's more like me plus assistance that I've directed or can hmm. direct because in large part, I find that the people coming from the world of Byzantine studies. So obviously we're, we're coming from two very different backgrounds in that uh, central Asian really does not have a lot of popular history uh, that's in the public consciousness. Whereas the Roman empire obviously does. Um, so you you have more people who come in and can potentially spread misinformation uh, from the get-go in a way that they can't with something like Central Asian reenactment. Not that they can't, obviously, with something like Central Asian, but you you know you've got people coming in and you know they're 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 they've got this these ideas that are taught either in the public education system or that they learn through populist histories about things like the Marian reforms, which weren't really a standardized system of reforms, or um, other things like that. Also from YouTube, obviously, a lot of YouTubers talk about either the Empire or uh, the Empire in the Middle Ages. So I, I did th that's an interesting approach, and one I am not, not intentionally, but am sort of de facto taking as well. Okay. I mean, it's definitely got advantages and disadvantages. Um, I can go into that now if you like. I mean, sure, yeah. Sure. So, I mean, like, on, on the plus side, um, it means it, you've got absolute control of what happens, um, which, to be honest, if you're trying to do good quality, is, is actually very useful. Um, because one of the major issues I see with, with large groups um, is that the bigger they get, the less standardized the gear is, and yeah. there's a lot of variation in um, what what's passable at events. Um, you know, because obviously in the UK we have a couple of very big groups and um, large conglomerate groups that are that are spread across the nation, and they have like splinter cells like here and there in different cities. Um, and um, so one of the issues is uh, the individual um, individual um, cells may or may not talk to each other and may or may not have you know varying amounts of. Um, compliance with like the 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 the, the, uh, the management at the top and so you do get some um variability and, and not necessarily a good way in terms of what kit you see on the field and the other thing with the large groups is um obviously to attract people you have to break down barriers to entry and the biggest barrier to entry for reenactment is the cost of it and mm -hmm. one way you can help break it down is by having 
um, off the shelf kit be allowable. And so you end up with these puffy, um, you know, very like, like puffy, stiff gambesons with big holes in the underarms and, you know, Indian made male that isn't tailored at all. And, yeah. um, you, you know, Spangen helms where instead of the bands being overlapped, they're just butted and welded and, 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 and issues like that, that, you know, when there's 300 of you, like kind of who cares? Cause when with groups that big people aren't going to see individual people and 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 actually talk to individual warriors with groups that big you want to get them on the field and fighting each other um that's why you have big groups um so you know for a spectator sitting 50 meters away it's like it's like it's, it's kind of immaterial whether or not these details are, are, are sorted or not um, by and large um but for you know what i'm aiming for is is a little bit different um it's not necessarily better it just has different goals around it um you know so i'm not really aiming to have a large battlefield organization what i want is is i, is I want to keep it small and i want to keep it intimate and, and i want to keep it um, high quality and i'm more interested at the moment in in sort of cultural outreach and education um, as opposed to treating it like a hobby and, you know, having a weekend out and um, doing the combat and the horseback riding and mm -hmm. the camping and, and that kind of things. Which, you know, if people are interested in that, that's another problem at all. You know, we need to um, acknowledge that reenactment is a very broad spectrum of, of activities and there's no... Okay, there there are wrong ways to do it, but but in terms of the right way to do it, there's a, a number of different approaches depending on what what your um what your um what what your goal is. So not all reenactors aim for public education, and I think that's absolutely fine. Um, there's there's I think there's been a lot of discourse in recent years of trying to push all reenactors into educator roles and sort of diminishing the spectacle side of things. But really, it's a spectacle that draws the crowds in. It's not a single guy talking about stuff. I have to be honest with you, um, as good as that is for the educational content. I don't know. Um, it, it, what, what do you think about that? Um, so, yeah, I have a very similar view, but also a different view in a few ways. Um, the big one is that I largely agree on your point that the degradation and quality of reenactment groups starts to come with size. And uh, from personal experience trying to help, since I'm a guy that people are constantly like, Oh, uh, what's your advice on this? Uh, is this historically accurate? Do, do you have an image of this artifact, right? So, and I get a lot of people asking me about well, they want to build a kit for something, or right? they want help with their Principate Roman or Late Roman or, or even Byzantine. Now, I've got a few people asking about that, and the the number of people who will go and buy things without consulting their group's leader first has always been a problem in reenactment. Yeah, absolutely. And, then you get into a situation where they've spent money, sometimes a lot of money, on something expensive or and that that might not be wholly passable or sometimes it's just straight up inaccurate. So you're in a situation where you don't want to discourage this person and make them want to just leave and not have to do anything with you or with reenactment ever again. Um but you also need to tell them, yeah, that sucks. Uh, <laughs> or, um, or like, you should have consulted somebody first before buying this. Hmm. And you, you, it, it's hard to tell people they wasted their money. And you also have the issue of people want to come into reenactment, usually doing a certain thing. And for the most part, that's military. It's mostly men. Well, let's face it. It's mostly yeah, men yeah, who yeah. want to do uh, military reenactment. Because uh, that's just the the the, the midlife crisis most forty year old men have. Is it mostly uh, forty year olds you're seeing? Because because from my point of view, um, and and everything I'm saying is just my personal opinion. It's just just anecdotes. But but from my point of view, what I mainly see is actually university students. Um, and you know, th th there's a big cohort of university students, and then as people enter their late twenties, thirties. Um, thing they, they sort of drop out of the scene because they have like careers and families and kids and mortgages yeah. and then people re-enter it um you know in their 50s and 60s when they've got a bit more time on their hands um but you know the, the sort of block between you know 30 and and, and 50 there's not that many reenactors in that age range um i have noticed i don't know what, what your view is i agree i agree on the point of the eras we usually do 
Um, and the reason for that is the reason I said like 40 year old people, 50 year old people having a midlife crisis is because the majority of reenactors in the world are not doing medieval or Roman. The majority are civil war reenactors, usually with some questionable views, okay. um, who tend to get into it as in, in many ways to reinforce their own ideology and stick around people, uh, with their own ideology. Okay. Um, so you see a lot of, I, I guess, and I guess that sort of changed because the civil war crowd has very much gotten older and, uh, there's sort of been a gap with, I'd say older millennials, younger gen X. I, th I think it's due to like an age gap with, uh, and an interest gap because in terms of when this was, when, when reenactment was starting, especially with civil war, civil war largely started up in the sixties. So it was a bunch of 20, 30, 40 year olds, whatever in the sixties. So they're mostly boomer generation, baby hmm. boomer generation, uh, getting together and doing these events. And then while they were drawing people in slowly, certainly, um, it, it's only recently been like from say, honestly, from like 2000 until now, really, because it was a bunch of movies at the end of the 1990s that got people spurred into looking up reenactment groups again with yeah. uh, Gladiator, The Patriot, uh, stuff like that coming out. Um, and I think recently, uh, Vikings has done, has done, um, I'm not going to say a good job, but it's done a job of, of, of um, enticing people into the Viking reenactment community. Um, and especially with younger people, um, obviously, right around 2001 to 2009, 2008, 2009, was the so-called golden age of video games. Yes. yes. Uh, which, and in that time, you had Age of Empires 2, uh, Rome Total War, Medieval 2 Total War, um, a bunch of strategy games just in general like Civ 5, etc. that were all sort of teaching people that, hey, the all these historical civilizations were a thing and putting like a visual to that on their screen, which when you have a visual definitely draws people in more than just reading about it in a school textbook, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and to be honest with you, um, it was actually one of the mods for Rome Total War that got me into it in the first place. I mean, it was the Europa Barbarora mod. And I was playing the Pathlava faction. This, this is really old now. I, I don't know when this is, but I was playing the Pathlava faction. They're the Orsosage. I'm like, well, damn, these guys are so cool. I want to I wanna be that guy, you know. <laughs> and and I, the first, like, like I got it, um, the first researchers from my kit were based around the Pathlava Griefbanzar in the video game. And I didn't know any better at the time, obviously, but um, you know that that's what that that's what started the the, the you know the, the train that got me here. Essentially, classic bright <laughs> pink tunics, <laughs> the the good old Rome uh, total not war. Not those guys. To, 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 I do want to cosplay those guys just because I think they're just like such a hilariously bad unit. Oh yeah, with the most garish outfits. Yeah, just go to well. Comic Con <laughs> dressed as that. That would be great. But um, be so on funny. my end, it's it's funny because. I got into reenactment, uh, well, I got into history because of the Barbarians 2 TV show on the History Channel uh, back in, like, fifth grade. So, yes, I, I, the History Channel got somebody interested in history. It's not just all ancient aliens out there. Um, I'm not sure if we have that in the UK. We might have. Uh, you've got BBC, uh, which tends to have... Well, we we had the History Channel because you can get it, you can, you you could get it on Sky and and Virgin, mm -hmm. which was NTL back back then. Um, but I don't know if we had that because because the the UK version is slightly different to the, to the yeah. American version. Um, but I, I don't know if we had that. We we might have. I don't remember. This is it was really hosted by ago. Terry Jones. Um, that does not help. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so. Uh, that that was that was the thing that got me into history, and then ironically i guess it's not ironic this is america after all and the south at that um i found out about the local roman reenactment group legion six ferrata through the fact that they used to do church presentations uh where they'd uh do like basically uh the the leader of the group uh, a man named rusty and a bunch of legionnaires would uh they'd communicate with the pastor to set up a date to do it and 
basically what would happen is that they'd start the service off normal, and then in the middle of it, um, the Romans would all come up from wherever they were hiding, uh, barge it through the church doors, uh, secure the doors, and then Rusty would go up on stage, and he'd be the the pa- the centurion that had nailed uh, Jesus Christ to the cross in the Bible, right? And give a <laughs> give a, give a presentation basically from his point of view. So um, and this is obviously in the middle of the height of the American evangelical Christian mu- movement back around like 2008 to 2012, roughly. Okay. Um, so the, this kind of stuff was popular. That's that's also where really shitty metalcore music uh, got really popular. <laughs> and I say this, I say that as someone who loves that genre. But um, uh, yes, universally known as Christcore. Very interesting, uh, very interesting topic. American evangelism, um, especially in the context of white supremacy. But uh, I'm getting off on a tangent at this point. But that is how I found out about a reenactment group. We never actually set up the church demo. Instead, what happened was uh, I went to Castro Romana that year and just visited, and we talked about it. And then the next year, I attended Castro Romana, which is the, 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 the big event we used to hold in South Carolina, where, say, like 20 guys would show up. We'd set up a Roman camp. We'd shoot the ballista, uh, give demos and presentations and stuff right here in South Carolina. And 2011 was my first reenactment event, so... In November of this year, I will have officially been doing it for 10 years. Nice. nice. Uh, so, yeah, I will officially have been doing reenactment, although that event is gone. It's been gone for several years now. So that is how I got into it. And to, to bring it back around to what we were talking about just a little bit ago, as for my approach as part of Romeo's, while I, I agree with a lot of what your approach is doing, Romeo's is very much education-focused rather than just go out and hit people with sticks focused um Hmm. which as fun as that is i mean i can do that in hema or something where there's actual a lot more value to it yeah exactly i I don't feel i need to dress up to do that um and i and i don't want to spend like a grand on an outfit and then have it you know, be damaged by somebody hitting me in the wrong place. Yeah, and we're we're usually talking also, more um, than a grand here. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the lower end. Yeah. Um, also, not gonna lie, like I've seen a lot of injuries, um, and I don't want to have any of them mm-hmm. myself. So it's just, it's, you know, if I was to do combat, um, I'd probably look into yeah, Hema or or, or even the SCA style where they use a Rattaner or something. And um, I so my goal with uh, Hema is to get into combat through uh, obviously in tournaments with normal Hema gear, but also through Harnish Fected, which is basically where we do drop 20k on full plate armor, which as long as you basically keep it scrubbed and polished so it doesn't rust, you're not gonna really get it damaged. <laughs> Okay, because it's because it's hardened steel plate armor, and uh, obviously that is a ridiculously expensive hobby and goal. It has very high barriers to get into, but you're doing historical combat in plate armor with the techniques they actually use to fight each other in plate armor. So there's a lot of real value to it. Um, and yeah, no, while when it comes to reenactment combat, I have no problem actually just going out and doing it. Um, it, it's not a focus for my group, and a lot a lot of reenactment relies on some of the more public uh, showy events. Definitely, like it, it particularly Roman. Hmm. Um, it's not that a place like an Italian festival is necessarily a good recruiting ground to pick people up, uh, as members. Which I mean, the by all means we have picked up people who were interested at an italian festival and ended up joining us but okay it's more like you need your group to be known about it's marketing in many respects and you can market to the academic community if you have those connections um but otherwise to them you're just another group in the background especially if your group is actually trying to be education focused that's a bad thing where um oh really because obviously, if you're trying to do an education-focused group, you're probably wanting to work directly with academia, which I'm sure we'll get, again, we'll get to that in a little bit. But um, in order to get, 
in, in order to get word of that your group exists out because uh i mean it, it's how you get gigs for shows and stuff people find out about groups through newspaper articles or uh, magazine articles a lot um online news now obviously is a big thing but um and and that kind of thing you know word gets around through one ear to another like oh did you see this in the uh the south carolina magazine and that's how we've gotten events that way in Legion Six and or or school demos. You you do a lot of school demos here if you're working on education uh, side of things. I definitely remember the old magazine days. So we had um, Skirmish Magazine in the UK, and there was another one. I never really got into them because I was slightly I was slightly too young for them, and they were kind of, for want of a better word, boomery. It, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just just like there's nothing wrong with the content it was just clearly not meant for my age group or, or my interest or whatever so um but we definitely had them but i i don't i'm i don't know if they still exist um but i know there's a lot a lot more happening online uh, particularly via facebook um which seems to be the main um rallying grounds for reenactors um, yeah in my experience yeah yeah and it's 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 uh Facebook, obviously, yes, that is, that is the big place. But Facebook is also still a terrible place to get word about your group out um, <laughs> if, if you want to be at events and stuff. And um, and I found just on, on the point of uh, where you talk about doing less reenactment events, so to speak, less of the camping and that kind of stuff, I find that a lot of that is still really useful and really important. Um, I, in part because my primary interest is the military side of things, even though sure. I, I'm interested, and in, especially with Romayos doing a more complete portrayal of Roman life and culture than the okay. standard uh, military reenactor tends to do. Okay, um, okay. Uh, especially because I want to work more with uh, people who don't do the military side of things, because part of doing a more complete portrayal, you know, you know, it's if you've got 20 soldiers at a camp cool but what about all the people who live with soldiers in their everyday life right and um so that, that that's a big thing with romaios uh doing a more complete portrayal of roman culture but um the whole camp setup and even uh doing battlefield demos so in roman we tend not to fight not here in the united states uh, it, fighting um, is not a big thing here. It's the same for early Romans here, but I think the late Romans here tend to do a bit of combat. Yeah, they definitely tend to do a, a more combat in late Roman, I've noticed. But um, in the United States, it's just a matter of not enough people compared to, say, some place like Europe where you can really do big mock battles, especially mm. when we have no one to fight except for other Romans, usually, at the, <laughs> at the best. So um, it's always been more public education-focused, which um, that that aspect has always needed improvement in the United States. Since, and here I as mean, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, since most people are still, you know, they buy an Osprey book as their source of information. But I find that the, the whole camping out and doing stuff that way and then going and doing drills in fields, because in the world of Roman military, we actually have drill manuals. So we can, if we have people, we can portray things like uh, formation movements and that kind of stuff, especially if you've got a lot of mo people and you can actually start doing something on the level of small unit tactics sure. uh, in a portrayal. Um, but like, that, that's that's part of the problem. So I mean, you said if you have people. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> which is a challenge in and of itself, really. You know. Yeah. So there, there's there's a few big challenges with putting and running a reenactment group. Uh, one is that uh, getting people to do it. And there's advantages to having a small group, which, as you said, is much easier to control versus having a large group, which you have a lot more error propagating in a large reenactment group. And not just in terms of quality of kit, but knowledge and research as well. You always have Definitely. you will always have the guy who just buys his outfit and shows up and wants to hang out and drink beer, basically. Um, <laughs> that, that, that guy is always a thing. And he, he never learns more than the bare minimum and never does more than the bare minimum. And that's the kind of person I don't want in my group. Hmm. But a lot of reenactment groups are okay with that just to have numbers, uh, especially if they're putting numbers on a field. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because, I, I mean, we have to be 
uh, like brutally honest and say let, let, reenactment it's a hobby um by and large it's not a profession we don't yeah. have credentials we're not most of the time not we're yet not paid to be there um yeah well <laughs> that's that's one we'll we'll, we'll we'll get to that at the end <laughs> by and large reenactors aren't paid to be there and so you know people come into the hobby for um for various reasons um but it is at the end of the day a hobby that people have to enjoy doing in order to continue doing because mm -hmm. there's no there's their whole incentive to be there is the enjoyment they get out of being there. Um, yeah, and especially, you know. and it's especially a lot harder harder because you and I are both doing non-West European reenactment uh, cultures. So, mm. uh, and that might sound weird to some of my listeners because I talk about I do Roman, but um, for a thousand years of Roman history, for those out there listening, and uh, Anthony Caldellis really goes into this much more in his book um his various books actually uh west european history does not consider the existence of the roman empire after 476 ad conducive to its narrative so they just write it off so byzantine or which is the medieval Ro period of the roman empire has gained much more popularity in public consciousness for better and for worse um it's still outside the usual west european realm of education and yeah, history yeah. and populist populist history like in a way that roman viking uh norman medieval french whatever is and then obviously with your group nadim uh central asia is at best an afterthought for most uh general <laughs> viewers best. yes so th the most common thing so when i do public events that are educational and the public are allowed to come in and ask questions um the the most common thing that i have to explain to people isn't about the sogdians or the end of the 7th or 8th century or what i'm wearing or all the things we're looking at it's here's a map <laughs> this part of the world is central asia yes it has its own history its own culture that's separate from europe um you know that's the level we're talking at mm -hmm. um it's um it, it's a completely different ball game and yeah you have to introduce people to the place you're talking about before you can start talking about the history and the culture and i, I gotta be honest with you it's quite draining to do that um like uh, you know on a busy reenactment event um i might have you know 40 50 people coming by and having that discussion with everyone is just like, oh my goodness, you know. It, it, it is a real drain. Uh, obviously, I'd imagine event like, events like IMC Leeds are better. IMC is 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 such a fantastic event. It, it, it's great. I I love it so much um, because you can tell that the event organizers really value not spectacle but um, the actual knowledge and expertise of the reenactors. And the other thing is is um, it, it's 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 in a university ground like on a weekday so um all the well not all of them, the vast majority of the people coming by your stand are um conference um uh, participants or students mm -hmm. or faculty or whatever and like you can talk about stuff it, it's actually very easy to have um yeah. really in-depth discussions about say you know Sogdian textiles versus um, Chinese textiles and the stylistic difference between them, mm -hmm. or Sogdian metalwork versus Sasanian metalwork, mm -hmm. or you know the political situation in Sogdiana um, in the early eighth century. Yeah, because you don't have to have. explain basic geography to them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Usually, exactly. usually. <laughs> Um, um, so I, I absolutely love that event. Um, I, unfortunately, our last attendance there had to be cancelled so because of COVID. The the entire um, conference yeah. um, got, I think it got redone online. Um, yeah, and it, it was event. online this year, I think. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure what the, what the future is with, with them. Um, I would love to be back. I really enjoyed that one. Yeah, um, and I yeah. feel like that's going to be a big issue. Again, we'll we'll get to that in a little bit, but... um. I feel like that's going to be a big thing with the future of both academia and our field. But yes, it's a very similar experience in America. Um, if you are not aware, America is literally at the bottom for geopolitical awareness in the world. I am aware um, of the, uh, the it memes. Is, yes. It is, <laughs> yes, it is worse than... Uh, Americans tend to know less about the rest of the world than people living in quote-unquote 
backwards or third world quote unquote countries uh, in Africa, South America, etc. That is how ill-informed Americans tend to be, which, you know, it says a lot about our own hypocrisy as a culture. So it's always fun having to explain to somebody that, no, we are Romans, not pirates, or uh, various things along similar lines at every event we do. I get that all the time. I get um, confused for samurai every now and again. Which okay, lamellar armor and like a moon and wings on my on my headgear. Yeah, that's a reasonable <laughs> yeah. connection. Yeah, Roman yeah. and Roman and Spartan. I can see why people call us Spartans. Pirate <laughs> says a lot else. Um, but yes, uh, that that that's always fun having to constantly explain the basics of what you are and what you do without even which i mean it, a lot of education is explaining the basics to people um mm. especially with kids because normally it's you get a lot of kids that come up um with yeah, their well, families and that, that's different so your, your approach to kids has to be different to your approach yes to people, because i mean the kids aren't like unless they're super geniuses they're not going to be interested in like the in, all the details that you want to tell people about they're there to look at the cool guy in his armor and yeah you know talk about that and they're there to look at the cool silverware and you know they're there to um play with your pen on some mm -hmm. um you know hemp paper and, and, and whatever which which is different you know so i do quite enjoy enjoy those interactions just just because like you actually do get a sense of wonder like, like they really enjoy it most yeah of the yeah they're uh, yeah. they're definitely much more curious and inquisitive and yeah, yeah. um they and they get more out of it too um mm. but yeah, and so I understand completely when it gets tedious having to explain to the average 30, 40, whatever year old person uh, that tends to go to this group uh, event with their family or whatever what basic geography is. It's like, well, well Italy is here, or <laughs> yeah. it's, it's sad enough here with America where they can't put point out like the Ukraine or whatever on a map. Yeah, um, and it, it would definitely be worse over here with Central Asia than at least than in Britain, because Britain, as a former global empire, tends to have a little bit more awareness. Slightly yeah, more. so like people can conceptualize India, Russia, China and the Middle East. Right. And yeah. you just say I'm in between all these four places. And, and that, 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 you know, that, that usually does the job of at least orientating people. Um, and then you you kind of build from there basically mm -hmm. um yeah 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 um and i i guess all this begs the question of what draws people in not just as viewers uh, as participants as well but also as viewers at a group like what what approaches not just in recreating a non-european culture but uh, I, this also sort of universally applies. Like, what setups? What 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 do you find works the best with like displays, interaction, uh, or, or setting even? Uh, what kind of events? So I mean, obviously this is all just personal anecdotal experience. Um, mm -hmm. but from my point of view, um, most people who come to a reenactment event aren't like you and me who are interested in speaking to historians and learning stuff. I think. Most people who come to a reenactment event are after a fun day out with the kids where they get to see the knights and they get to see, you know, pet the horses and they get to try some archery and they get to buy a wooden sword for their kid and then they go home. I, I, you know, that's the impression I've gotten um, because, to be honest, I, I think I've actually guested at more reenactment events than I've uh, attended as a participant mm -hmm. um, j just because uh, in kid, obviously, but just because I, I find it a lot less stressful to just rock up for the day walk around meet people take some pictures and then go home yeah show um, up and dress up yeah that, yeah exactly, exactly that's sort of our uh, italian festival approach usually yeah I, I mean to be honest you putting on an exhibition is, is a lot of work and you know for one or two people it's it's quite stressful um mm -hmm. which to be honest i think is the major downside of having a small group is is it's a, it's a hell of a lot of work for one or two people to do mm -hmm. Um, and it, it does get exhausting and it means, you know, if, if you can't make it, if you're sick or if you're just really tired, um, 
there's nobody to, to, to cover for you, um, which if there was a bigger group, there'd be a pool of people you, you, you could draw in to do that. Mm -hmm. And it also means that after driving, you know, two hours, getting there at like 7 a.m., um, setting yeah, try up. try eight hours for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, okay, fine. But in the UK, we're not really used to driving long distances, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we, <laughs> I mean, our, our entire country is, is like, well, I don't know, 10 hours from one end to the other. I, I don't know. I've never, never done that drive, but it's certainly not not huge. Um, so from my point of view, a two-hour drive is a very long drive. Um, but no, you, you've driven a significant distance. You've spent an hour or two hours setting up, and then you know, you've got to do all the public-facing activities for six hours, mm -hmm. and then you have to pack up, which is another two hours. Then you got to drive back home for two hours, and then you got to unload the car, which takes two hours, and then you, whatever you maintenance ready. you've got afterwards. Uh, what? What's right? Too. I, I was saying, and also, you know, you got to count like whatever maintenance you have to do on all of that stuff you're bringing to set up, right? Both yeah, immediately yeah, yeah. afterwards and like worn. Yeah. over time, yeah. Because like if you don't take the time to go set your tent up out in the yard to let it dry out after a reenactment event, it gets moldy right yeah and exactly. like armor all has to be re-oiled and put into storage you know lacing um, will need re-knotting and, and yeah you know polishing and, and whatever yeah replacing yeah, uh, exactly so you know, you know doing one person gig is, is sorry what was the original question again we i got completely off topic there <laughs> um oh no we were discussing uh specifically what draws people in oh yes of course and yeah, yeah, yeah. both no, no, in terms said, of like so, the displays so, you're setting up and uh yeah so, so what draws people in as a, as a spectator i think is is the spectacle um which is what i think the big groups do really well because um for spectacle you need you know 50 60 you know 200 people on a field hitting each mm -hmm. other because that's entertaining and that's what sells the tickets and you need horses because it's entertaining and it sells tickets and people get to pet the horses afterwards which everybody loves doing um but uh, you know there's another group of people um who tend to go to reenactments and the you know they're usually um not not single but they usually go alone or you know with friends um and they're the guys who are actually interested in, in the history and they'll go and they, they'll be the ones who'll be talking to all the various camp goers and actually mm -hmm. talking about history and gear and food and campment and that kind of thing so so th those are really the two sort of cohorts of people who come to events in my experience i might be wrong what's your experience of this i tend to find that yeah you're right with the spectacle you um I, I, again those are not the types of events i have been to since most of my events have been all like stand around and talk to people events basically um okay. with the occasional like field drill presentation or that kind of thing um so in america the definition of a large group around here is like 20 people, not like 200 people. <laughs> um, okay. So, I, I mean, uh, 200 people, that's for like our, our big conglomerate societies, which are nationwide. Yeah, I don't think like they'd Regia be a single. Or the yeah, like. yeah. Um, and that, that's the I, same here. Like Legion 14 is like 120-ish people, I'd say. And that's all the way from Cali to um, Maine to like Florida. So, so the entire country. Yeah, the, the entire continental U.S. And technically then some, a few overseas. So, yeah, the definition of a large group around here is like 20 people. But with the events I've been to, I find what tends to draw people in is the interactive part of things. So if you've got someone doing like a Roman woman, right, and they've got the, the safe historical makeups that hmm. people can try out because a lot of those makeups had like mercury or Lead leather the, the light, yeah. yeah in them um so a lot of them are just uh on display in sealed jars airtight jars uh that you can see through but uh to see what it looks like but you can't touch it because it, it'll poison you yeah. um and then uh but no it's it's stuff like that where we will have uh foods people can try um or if we're lucky we could have there was one guy who used to do um, a medical impression, so uh, a, a doctor, a field doctor, Roman field doctor, and he'd have all of his surgeon's tools, and he'd um, we and uh, a bunch of like uh, things doctors would use, like um, bags of scrolls with re reconstructed texts on them, that kind of stuff. Um, we'd have demos where we did pay, like we'd have the signifer get up there. Um, 
or the Vexillarius, since we're at the Century level, sorry. Um, and he would dole out the unit's pay with the Centurion, and then we'd have, like, little skits and interaction for that. Um, but in terms of displays, it was stuff like that. It was stuff uh, like, um, like, we had a crane. So one of our guys in our unit was an engineer. So he was the guy who had the ballista, the crane, the, the like, siege... Uh, the big seed shield. I can't remember what the Latin word for it off the top of my head is, but it's like a big wicker shield you hide behind and push up to the walls. Um, so he had that kind of stuff. And like they, we'd have bricks and stuff and people could stack up bricks and build like little, little sections of wall or whatever with the crane. So we, I find that that is what keeps people. It, 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 it draws them in in the first place, but it also keeps people engaged um in a way yeah, that I'd just agree walking that. Yeah, up to a dude definitely. standing there doesn't and that's what i was kind of wondering you about because i know uh wanted to ask you about because i know you talked about just briefly earlier about mentioning uh kids writing on hemp with a sogdian pen and stuff like that and i know you have a lot of more interactive elements um uh correct yeah yeah so so some of the things that we, that we did or um yeah that we did i guess is the, is the proper word so th there was the calligraphy thing which uh uh, which was fun until I did it too much, and then it got really boring. <laughs> um, uh, so that that was fine. Um, the the coins are always a big hit. So I've got a I've got a collection of um, replica coins, and I have a small collection of genuine mm -hmm. coins, uh, at least genuine to my eye. I'm not a numismatician, so that's something people like want to buy. Yeah, too. yeah, and and the thing is, like, like you know, people actually like comparing the old systems of money to what we use nowadays, which mm -hmm. is cards and you know paper and and the occasional coin by and large and they're like this is so mm -hmm. different and like, yeah it is different um seals are always a good one because you can take like some clay with you in a sealed container so it stays wet mm -hmm. and you know you give people um um so i've made some replica seals and you can give them that to you know have those stamping and, and i bought some um sasanian forgery seals <laughs> they were marketed as genuine but i'm like these are not genuine yeah uh but thankfully they're also priced as forgeries so uh, they were like pretty cheap and i'm like oh this is great i can use these as interactive things for um for people to play with so that's always fun and then my buddy um seb he is he's actually really good at doing the arms and armor display so i actually leave that to him completely mm -hmm. um, because he has he has a lot of combat experience that i don't so um mm -hmm. people like listening to his stories about how his uh, friend dislocated his shoulder or whatever um yeah, yeah but yeah, yeah having actual experience in uh first hand combat is it makes for a very different viewpoint and uh cuz i've had friend i have a couple of friends who have had that experience and i won't share their names or their stories but they have been in the very close quarters melee quotation marks combat in dire situations so they have mm. a perspective that most reenactors don't to educate mm. people on but obviously people who have been in that situation do not want to talk about that situation and <laughs> you know that yeah, that's yeah that, it's because it, because it's a traumatic experience experience yes so exactly. while that is valuable perspective to have it's not it's not something you can just bring to an event, so to speak. Yeah, it, it's not the sort of controlled combat you get in reenactment where mm -hmm. everybody's or on the same Kima. page. And, yeah, everyone's on the same page. And, like, the, the, you know, the, there's target zones you hit. And, uh, you know, every, it's all consent and, and you can opt out. Like, you know, you yeah. can say, I'm injured, stop it. And they'll, they, you know, they'll stop and it. There's a, you know. the, the, and that, that's its whole own debate, which I'll probably have to have with... Um, uh, an combat. episode Not about enough. yeah someone who does a lot more reenactment <laughs> combat or or maybe my hema instructor where uh -huh. um like what you can learn from that there's a lot you can learn from that um having two large groups of people fight each other um especially when it comes to like uh like crowd psychology and things like that but there's okay. also a lot of limitations to uh that that sort of combat as well because you have two groups of people going in knowing firsthand that they are not going into co uh, to fight and kill each other. So you don't have exactly the same behaviors as, uh, as well as obviously the exactly the same uh, ways people are trying to stab each other specifically. Um, but yeah, you're right. That so you would people, on a real battlefield. So, so people knowing that they're very likely to come out unharmed, you know, maybe some bruises, but that'll be it. And if they are harmed, they're, 
what an hour or so from uh, the nearest uh, emergency department at most um, yeah exactly so so i think knowing that um does change people's psychology um yeah yeah you're definitely right there although i again it's not something i have first-hand experience with i yeah. did do a bit of reenactment writing um uh, and the thing is with cavalry stuff you tend not to do combat because mm -hmm. It's just too unpredictable and it's too unsafe. And also, you know, there's also a, a question of animal uh, rights with that as yeah. well. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so uh, you do, with the exception of jousting, obviously, <laughs> that's its own thing, though. I I'm not gonna get into that. Um, yeah, I've never done that. I have no desire to do that. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, like I said, that's its own thing. That's its own topic for another time. Um, yeah, and yeah. all of this really is. But um. Yeah, I find I, I guess the big question though is on the other hand, because to what we were just talking about, what pushes people away from doing, uh, not, uh, both doing reenactment and also interacting with a group? Like, because as a small group, I, I feel like small groups like yours and mine uh, benefit more from being at the interactive having like these these bi these interactive setups um where people are able to experience the past with their hands uh i guess is the way to put it um and learn that way because you've then then you've got all three elements of like what you use to teach in a classroom because you've always hmm. got you've got the audio learners the video learners and the uh the tactile learners they talk about over here um with like education and when you have that tactile element, which a lot of reenactment re groups tend not to have beyond like, here, you want to hold this replica hammer or the, or the like, which, I mean, sure, it's interesting if you can hand a kid like a little, like, uh, a, well, I'm, I guess that depends on the age of the kid, but like a dull <laughs> sword or something like that for them to, lo to hold and look at. Uh, that, 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 there's a question of safety rules with that, obviously, even with a dull object. Um, cause that thing still can hit like a crowbar, but, uh, when you have like a tactile interaction, uh, where you're keeping people engaged on all, in all three ways, I feel like our small groups like us benefit from that a lot more than the spectacle side of things where you have like 60 guys out on a field, you know, yelling, their I agree, little Viking, yeah, I agree, I whatever. Agree, yeah. Um, it's, it's drawing a different crowd or it might be the same crowd. Who have had their appetites wet by watching the um, the spectacle, but, mm -hmm. but but you know what I mean, um, yeah, yeah, and um, but on the other hand, there's obviously stuff that has to push people away with um, a small group, and I I feel like I, I don't know what your experience is, um, I think part of it is definitely the fact that your small limits how much you can bring out. Absolutely. And, yeah, absolutely. Um, so because you're small, it means you can't do activities safely, which means you can't attract members, which means you can't grow. So you stay small. So you can't do activities, you know, and it's kind of the spiral that way, um, mm -hmm. because most people don't get a reenactment to, you know, spend hours on um, sifting through Russian PDFs to try to figure out yeah. what these objects are. You know, most They're people get a reenactment like to have a fun weekend out to do vaguely historical activities. And so you got to have those activities on the table um, for people to join. Um, and if you don't have those because you're too small, it means you're going to stay small because no one's going to want to do the stuff with you. Um, so that's one big barrier, in my opinion. Um, another thing is, so um, the financial thing is a big, a big issue. Yeah. Right? So, um, you know, a, a reenactment kit, um, a, a good quality reenactment kit for the, the, you know, the types of impressions that, that you and I are putting together where we're actually paying attention to details, you know, mm. you it can come to half a grand for the soft kit, um, you know, without any accessories, and then you can add on belts and jewelry and whatever. And then you want, uh, you know, you'll want some wooden objects and you want some ceramics and you want some silverware. And you might want some coins. Then, oh, because we're guys and we, you know, we 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 like armor, you know, we like you'll want... arm... shiny yeah. objects. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And you you know, you want some armor, and and that, that that's just the money sink, yeah, depending and... on you know what you want to do with it. And the cost barrier is obviously bigger with stuff like what we do. We're busy. Yeah, because or, there, there's nothing off the shelf um, at all. And it, well, a bar you... like Hel Helgi's True History Shop or something like that. Um, but even then, that's not like going to Cult of Athena and buying something remotely passable with, because uh, with Roman you can do that. You can go to like 
Cult of Athena or um, a bunch of other sites. Armai, I guess, is the one in the the Europe now. Yeah. Um, yeah. where you can buy like a Gladius for like 150 bucks, and it's passable for an event. And like you, you, you may need you, if if you have no desire to replace it at this point, a Deepika Gladius, the newer ones at least, are good enough that you never really have to worry about replacing it for the sake of like accuracy because it looks like the real thing and hmm. unless you actually care about aspects of authenticity which we'll talk about next i guess <laughs> um you'll never have to worry about replacing that object and uh it's not like that like i could tell you right now just taking a quick look at my own uh finances spreadsheets um the the i assume <laughs> yes the uh <laughs> yes and the the entry level for middle byzantine so we're talking like 10th 11th 12th century so like this is the area most people who think byzantine want to do is right around 1k for just the soft kit items so right. you're talking like 200 dollars per tunic like 50 dollars for a turban um a cloak's probably around 200 uh pants are around 200 shoes and a belt around 200 together so you're looking at right around 1k for just basically what you need to show up an event unless you can sew that's the big difference if you can yes, sew and leather yes. work uh yourself that is the thing that significantly reduces that entry barrier the most definitely um, definitely but the thing is, you mentioned Helgi's true history shop can you know, he does some high quality. We don't even have that in Solgiana. So every single thing that I need has to be a custom order, mm -hmm. which means I have to find somebody I can trust to do it, which is in and of itself a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I then have to design the object, which, you know, for some things, fine. You can read a couple of papers where they'll be describing a tunic or a pair of trousers, and you're like, okay, perfect, I'm done. But for other things you know you're i won't say you're shooting in the dark but you've really got to you know take all the evidence you have and then decide how you're going to reconstruct it yourself like with swords for example i've i've been looking for a new sword yeah. for for god over a year but the reason i haven't got one is because i need to design the damn thing and i know it's gonna set me back like at least what one two two grams um so yeah. i don't want to design it wrong so i'm just like sitting on it um because i don't have a sword i can copy i have bits and pieces that i can copy um but it's not the same you know i i don't have any scabbard fittings that i can copy that have been yeah well and I, I i'm in the same yeah. spot with um so in the past oh, the the number of people just going off of dawson's equipment which at its time was like the best we had but now that we actually have archaeology coming out of like bulgaria for byzantine uh -huh. since greece and turkey still don't give a fuck really about byzantine <laughs> to um I'm not sure how much I should cuss in this, but um, <laughs> it's your channel. Yeah, so um, uh, I've uh, Leonardo Danelas in Spain is the one making my saber, and you know obviously it's a pricey investment, but um, to go to do something like Byzantine and to have to go to someone who knows what they're doing, um, and like uh, especially when it comes to something like. You might have the saber parts, for example, like you've got the iron, the uh, the or like the metal hilt fittings, but then there's still a bunch of open-ended questions, like okay, how did they make scabbards? Uh, how did yeah. they do their scabbard leather? How did they do their uh, what was what kind of wood did they use? Um, yeah, yeah. So and while like someone like Oleg of Helgi's True History Shop, you know, if you've got that information, uh, they can usually do a pretty decent job of it. Um, if you don't and you have to work from the more complex perspective of looking through art and archaeology and surrounding cultures like what they did before and later maybe or what mm -hmm. they did in like uh, places where that does survive like Egypt or the Caucasus then it gets a lot harder especially as things you start encountering the issue of course of the number of academic sources that just aren't available online exactly yeah and plus you have or to in your language mind. so um a lot of craftsmen um actually know quite a lot about the archaeology and history so so they're very useful um mm -hmm. because you can 
actually discuss the source material with them, uh, which is great. But again, that's not something that I have in my scene because no craftsmen know the Sogdian archaeology that well. Um, you know, no, it's 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 a completely different ball game when you yeah, with the exception of maybe some people who do clothing. That yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I. Yeah. I think you're right because for a lot of the clothing, um, we ever have to go. Well, certainly for the lapel coats. To be honest, the best source for that is probably Moshe Vayabalka. Um, yeah, the various Caucasus finds. So you've got people like um, Cassia Gromek or Katarina Katonic and the like. Um, I think Yulia is the one you just went to, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Who actually know about the material archaeology of clothing and places especially those who live in russia and have access to all that stuff directly like katarina or yulia um and who 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 they know they know about old termes and can read those papers and they know about uh mashavaja balka or any any of the other sites in the caucasus or even the stuff in the middle middle east because uh katarina has given me plenty of papers on finds in the, from the middle east that aren't well known um especially when it comes to the early middle ages like you've got um halabia in syria has a bunch of like principate and late roman stuff but it's also got a bunch of uh early middle ages stuff now uh, i think i sent is... you some of the stuff in there didn't i yeah uh, i I, I probably sent you the paper i had on it which is the okay. basis for my uh really really fancy tunic that's still i found the publication made. from the 30s just by chance it's in french um no the one really good stuff in there. The, the one i sent is not from the 30s it's from like six years ago okay. so this okay. is very recent excavations but yeah so yeah um and that is in itself a barrier because you know if research is definitely a barrier to people getting into reenactment um because you've got different degrees of people who want to do it at different levels. You've got the people who are absolutely insane, like you and me. Um, you've got the people who are want to commit to like a good level of accuracy, but don't put in, I guess, the academic level, uh, autodidactic. Uh, they don't have that autodidactic tendency we do, um, at, at least not at this level. And then you've got the people who want to just buy the kit, show up have a drink with their friends at night and go home the next day um hmm. so you obviously and obviously there's middling grounds in between all three of those rough categories but that's sort of what you've got um and then you know that 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 just the the research doing the research doing the reading uh to do well at an event so you can talk on your own without having to have someone come by and correct you or you can buy a kit and not have to worry too much about consulting your group leader which is, i guess is a big deal why people make a big deal out of out of kit guides now it, that that's that's a barrier and the cost itself is a barrier that that's obviously a big thing that pushes people away exactly and, um, and if you're spending a, a, a grand on on you know fancy dress you've got to know for sure it's something you want to be doing long term mm -hmm. because that's not you know that's not just pocket change that that's a significant chunk of money um yeah, yeah like i've yeah, got definitely. a pair of hosen i had to buy a new pair of which katarina is making at the moment and because the old ones well they didn't fit right and they honestly just weren't the best choice for what i'm doing so like they're 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 just sitting disassembled as something i can't even sell because like <laughs> You know, you know, when you buy, when you drop money on something, you can't recoup that cost usually. No, 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 no. Um, and especially if it's a custom order, um, you, you know, especially like it's my, for something weird too. Yeah, like, like some of my old Sasanian gear, I'm trying to get rid of, and, and it's just, it's just, there's no buyers because nobody else is doing Sasanian reenactment. Like I can't so even find, gonna, yeah. I can't even find like SCA guys to buy my stuff. So, <laughs> well, I mean, SCA has it, SCA is its own thing, and. I think we often conflate SCA with reenactment um, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, you know, the higher end of SCA is essentially reenactment, but it also encompasses a bunch of other things. Um, for SCA combat, for example, is very different from reenactment. Yeah, combat. SCA is very big on like artisans and crafts in a lot of ways that reenactment yeah. isn't. Um, but and a lot of those SCA artisans and crafts like have the same issue uh, with reenactors. We've got people who are kind of like at this middling level 
where they're interested and they're doing this stuff and they're doing like these little SCA workshops where they teach other people about it, but they don't actually know it at the level of someone like, I don't know, like Matt Bunker can make a scabbard or um that kind of thing. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, and it, so it they, they do I think some it depends wrong who thing. it is. It's very person dependent. Yeah, it's a, a um, yeah. That that's true of SCA reenactment, all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, but it it also brings up the question of, I guess, moving on from this finally into uh authenticity. Um, because you start getting into these differences between like what constitutes SCA, what constitutes like LARPing. Uh, you've got reenactment, and then you've got living history, and there there's some divisions there, and a lot of it is individual based. Because you've got the question of authenticity and immersion, and those are both big things when it comes to drawing people in or pushing people away, because you have groups that commit to those on different levels, but Hmm. um, uh, everyone also has their own different definition of what that is, and for some people that's being out on the field in that big spectacle, hitting each other with blunted uh, iron and uh, with their own little combat rules and everything, and you know that's when they think immersion or having an authentic experience that's that's what they do but for others it's more like you and i well i guess maybe not because i i i not honestly me. my experience of authenticity is very different from the standard reenactment experience of authenticity uh-huh. but i'll let you continue um yeah well like you and i i will i want to say you and i are much more like uh, you and I probably have a definition of authenticity and reenactment that's more on the level of something like Carnuntum 333, or I guess for maybe more what more of the viewers out there would be familiar with, Historic Jamestown um, here in America, where there's like a full, a real authentic or immersive experience has a relatively large group of people doing it. I'm not going to say like a thousand people populating a whole reconstructed city, or but more like You've got 50 to 60 people at like a villa like Carnuntum, and they're, they're they're creating authentic experience by presenting to the public not only through direct interaction but also by going about like uh, daily lives, and that that brings obviously into the question of like a role playing element uh, to it, which you have at something like Historic Jamestown, but um, and obviously a place like that offers like very specific training and everything to to create a living history experience Hmm, and hmm. i feel like that's what you and i would both consider like having an authentic experience more so more than just even the level of like having a say a middling size group let's say 20 guys uh, we all bring out our authentic tents and our authentic uh camp equipment and generally try to to keep things in period so to speak um, in the time frame of whatever we're representing, we sure uh, we still like sit down and have like drinks at the campfire or whatever after the event, and during the day we have our spectacle of whatever sorts, educating people, etc. Um, but this is on like a different level, a much more immersing yourself in the like actual reconstructive uh, level of. Uh, experimental archaeology and living history, bringing it to, trying to bring it to life as it would have been in their lives. Hmm. Not sure I agree with you on that one, actually. So, uh, from my point of view, um, so authenticity, yeah, you're correct. It, it means different things to different people. So y- you are completely correct in that some people uh, value the combat as an experience of authenticity. Um, some people value doing craft as an experience of authenticity. Or just what they're wearing, too. Yeah, or, or some people value, yeah, exactly, value having a hand-stitched, hand-dyed, hand-woven garment yeah, like, as a value I of authenticity. Do, but... yeah, I, yeah, I know. The, the thing is, um, so authenticity isn't a, a concrete, d- discrete yes-no thing. It, it's it's a spectrum, for starters. Um, so you can be more authentic or less authentic. I don't think any of us, at any point ever in our reenactment, careers for want of a better word has felt 100 percent authentic in anything that we're doing Mm -hmm. um now in in regards to the immersion thing that you mentioned you know people feeling authentic um around the campfire or whatever okay i'm not going to negate other people's experiences and and if they feel immersed um 
good for them um you know there's more power to them it's not something i've ever been able to achieve um mm -hmm. you know and it, it doesn't matter what the event was what i was wearing um how historically accurate all the gear was um from my point of view um i knew full well that if i got sick there'd be hospitals and antibiotics and, and, and x-rays and whatever um i knew full well that i had clean drinking water um i knew that i had to go back to work in two days um you know and i knew that i had to you know a, a two hour this is all stuff in the back of your head you know you, you kind of just just know you're, you're not going to be food scarce you're not going to struggle with water if you're sick you'll probably be fine um, you have to go back to work or university or whatever it is um, in a few days' time. You've got to drive later on. These are all things in the back of your mind. Um, and, and also, you're all speaking English. And also, I'm an Asian guy in England, which <laughs> um, in and of itself is you just feel out of place. Now, I'm not going to debate the historicity of uh, non-European peoples in medieval Europe. That's not something I know anything about. But, you know, from, mm -hmm. from a authenticity feel kind of thing it, it it i i didn't feel particularly in place um mm -hmm. shall, we, shall we say um that's not to say other people uh with a similar background you know who, who aren't on your peer can't feel in place it's just i personally mm -hmm. didn't feel in place in um trying to pretend to be historical in in mm -hmm. europe you know? yeah like um, i'm a white german guy being a basically a turkish a, a turk before they were turks is so like <laughs> obviously there's some questions there but um there's uh but no i i, I get exactly what you're saying because i have not i have not had that either like even at something like castro uh castro romana but we've tried to bring out everything um that we can for an authentic quotation mark experience um it's not at the same level as something like uh an event that's actually got its own funded setup and everything like historic Jamestown or Carnuntum or yeah yeah and, and the thing is with, with with Jamestown and Carnuntum is is that they're they're physically on geographically appropriate and not just you know what people are wearing and mm -hmm. eating and sleeping under having which houses is whole, and stuff yeah it, it's it's this whole other thing because I did an event in Europe um in um in twenty sixteen I think it was and it was it was a whole completely different thing to what I'm used to in in the UK because we were actually in a in an old uh, Roman villa and uh, you know with the gardens and stuff and the atmosphere mm -hmm. was completely different but that's kind of it by the by um, in regards to the immersion the authenticity so th there's two experiences that I can speak to um, that for me have given me a sense of authenticity um, and they're probably going to be very different from what the average reenactor feels and it's partly because of what I do because I, I study Sogdiana which is nowadays Uzbekistan and Tajikistan um, so the first um, experience of authenticity that I really felt authentic in um, I was wearing nothing historical I was wearing a t-shirt and jeans and I had a, you know <sighs> my, my Sony camera on my neck and I had a backpack full of water um, but I was in Samarkand and I was in the Afro Siob Museum and I I saw the paintings um, in the Hall of Ambassadors, which dates mm -hmm. to the middle of the 7th century, in the museum. And it's the original paintings. Um, and, and that, so I had the whole place to myself because it's completely off the usual tourist trail. Um, so being there in that hall by myself, seeing the paintings that I'd seen photographs and, and watercolors of like you know, a thousand times. But, but seeing that in in the flesh and it was laid out you know how it would have been as well um so seeing that was probably the most authentic or immersive experience i've had despite the fact that it had nothing to do with reenactment and i you know i was clearly wearing modern clothing um but just being in the same place as these things mm. and seeing them has its own metaphysical quality in, in, in my opinion so, yeah so that's and the first thing um, I agree yeah, with that. I agree with that uh, in many, on many levels because living in America, obviously nothing over here is Roman. Uh, hmm. We're, yeah. we're uh, an entirely different ocean away on an entirely different continent. Um, so obviously you cannot have that level of experience here in the United States without paying thousands of dollars to fly out to Europe, uh, get a hotel and uh and actually walk into somewhere where you can have an experience like that like um like if i it, it, it's obviously got an even uh, another level to it if it's actually still in its own historic location rather than just yes. uh in a museum yeah, yeah, definitely definitely yeah uh, cough british looting people um <laughs> um but um so like 
you know, you can go off the tourist, the beaten tourist track to a place like Ravenna and have that experience with Roman stuff since Ravenna is not exactly a hugely well-known uh, tourist site, at least when it comes to people touring Italy for the things Italy is known for, which is Rome, Venice, like uh, Florence, Naples, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, obviously there's a lot to be said for being able to like experience Pompeii for yourself like that, but without all the cat piss smell. Um, <laughs> okay. you know, Pompeii has a real problem with that. Um, the long, uh, short, long story short, but yeah. Um, no, I agree with you on that point of having an immersive experience. And that was part of what I was trying to get at in some ways with, um, talking about a place like Carnuntum. Because mm -hmm. especially if it's like an actual, like they've rebuilt the Roman villa that was actually there or something like that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You can have an experience like that, especially if some of the stuff that was originally there was still there. And uh, if you throw in, because what you talked about earlier with everyone speaking English or everyone speaking German or whatever, that's something that I feel like. And Stilico, we talked about this with Stilico as well. And for my viewers out there, Stilico is an Austrian man who runs one of the most influential late Roman scenes or late Roman groups and is one of the most influential people in like the historical reenactment scene in general, I'd argue, um, especially when it comes to political influence that there is. And Stilico, uh, we often discuss things with him. Stilico has also argued alongside me that there is a much greater need for properly trained individuals um like something like historic jamestown does where they've got like a six month training they do for all of their employees so they're all qualified to talk about things at historic jamestown. But that, that's the thing you just said that that's exactly the difference you just said employ employees um but reenactors aren't employees exactly um, yeah. yeah so so that that's I'm not going to say it's part of the challenge, but it, it, it's one of the factors, um, one of the factors here. Yeah. But where I was going was um, uh, the number of reenactors actually conversing in something like Latin or Greek would go a long way to improving an immersive experience, not just for us, but for the audience. And well, obviously uh, that it, is it a depends. very difficult. Uh, it, it, I agree that it depends. And it's obviously it, a very difficult thing to accomplish, especially when it comes to something like the actual way they talked versus the way someone, an English speaker like me pronounces Latin. Because this was yeah. something um, Luke Ranieri has a whole channel about this, um, about like the differences between and like how to actually pronounce Latin and Greek like they did um, and how it's actually reconstructed and all the different methods even for reconstructing it. And I think it adds an element that's missing, but achieving um, so, that is is uh, another barrier, let's say, especially... I think that would be immersive for spectators, for sure. Um, I'm not sure with how immersive it would be for participants, because mm -hmm. um, we... That our requires brains effort. Would... Yeah, exactly. Like our brains would register Latin or Greek as a foreign language, whereas Romans and Greeks wouldn't. <laughs> for their point of view, it'd be their primary language. So their it, it would take a lot it. of yeah to to bring back conversational Latin um, or <laughs> conversation. Well, in, in the case of Greek, modern Greek is not terribly far removed from something like Byzantine Greek that okay. you can make it work. Um, uh, if you had a lot of native Greek speakers or a lot of people who were just trained how to speak modern Greek. Um, Attic Greek is very different in a lot of ways, um, not just in pronunciation, and, but also in grammar, syntax, uh, all sorts of things. It's got things in it that modern Greek had, doesn't anymore because of a Vulgate. And obviously modern Greek has Turkish influence. Adding, uh, adding that to it uh, to create a more authentic or ex immersive experience well, you could do something like that with Byzantine with a bunch of modern Greek speakers, probably, if you could find the people and get them interested and get them into Byzantine reenactment to begin with. That is something to, to for me to converse in Latin. I have to think about, OK, what the fuck am I about to say in Latin first? Yeah. And so, like, it's not something I can just snap off a response to, especially considering I'm still one of those people, obviously, that, you know, just sits down with a Latin dictionary whenever I need to use Latin. Uh, Cause I've only had three semesters compared to people who've had six, let alone someone like, uh, again, Luke Ranieri, who's 
basically one of the world experts, arguably, and actually doing conversational Latin. Like, there's only one guy in the world who is a true master of Latin, and he's some dude in Michigan. I can't remember his name. Um, and he's, like, the only one who can probably speak it anywhere near like the Romans could. Um, that is how fluent and how easily he can roll it off his tongue and everything else he is with the language. And there's only one person in the world like that. There's a lot of conversational Latin speakers in the academic community um, who will do, who can do it, um, but not at the level to deliver an immersive experience. And obviously we'll get into the point of what the future of reenactment looks like. You know, if you were actually employing people, maybe that could change. Um, where if you're employing people and Latin and using Latin and using it correctly is, you know, what they're making 25 bucks an hour to do. Um, that That's obviously an ideal figure, I guess, but uh, that's a different situation um, hmm. uh, than a bunch of hobbyists who decide to get together, learn Latin over the summer, take like six months of it, um, which is enough to get like, enough to get like the basics of like Latin or Greek, uh, ancient Greek, and be able to use them and then practice on their own afterwards. And that has its own cost entry, at least in the United States where uh, college level education is ridiculous, hideously expensive. Um, mm -hmm. Europe, uh, you all have the advantage of college, not necessarily being free, but being far cheaper. Um, even then it's still a cost yes, barrier. Yes, yes. In terms of discussing the differences in like reenactment, living history, creating an authentic and immersive experience, and we've been talking about the reenactor so far, but obviously the public is a big thing, and yeah. uh, I feel oh, sorry, like I don't you. the, the sex. Sorry, I said there were two things about authenticity, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> so the second thing, sorry, completely, completely changed the track for a second. The second thing was, um, so this is actually reenactment related. Um, I got a replica of one of the soggy and silver dishes. Um, I saw is that. It a, is it a perfect replica? No, it's not microscopically perfect like some of the European smiths tend to make them. Um, but it was made by a master in Bukhara. And it, not going to lie, it's probably not that far off geographically from where the original dish might have been made. Um, you know, which has, again, it's got its own sense of authenticity around it. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, more so than had a had um, Dane perfect Geld or replica. Someone make it. Yeah. yeah, so uh, an imperfect replica. I, I, I'm not going to say imperfect. It, it is beautiful. Um, you know, but um, so this replica made in Uzbekistan, in my opinion, has more authenticity than a microscopically perfect replica made in Europe would have and that's something i have also slowly started to been incorporate um like my red tunic is made it's not with it's not turkish or greek cotton it's syrian cotton but mm -hmm. even then that is to use cotton from syria uh a place where historically that you would have been able to get cotton from in the middle byzantine period the say 1000 ad instead of cotton from that was grown here in the united states has its own uh air of authenticity to it especially yeah. because in places like the middle east or uh central asia it probably is being made with more traditional methods um obviously a lot of these places are you still using machinery and there's machine yeah. woven yeah um, i'm not so sure how similar uh, it would be now compared to you know, but um <laughs> even interacting with a vendor uh from that part of the world tends to be a much more authentic experience because it's usually a smaller time person you're getting uh you're you're get you're putting in a special order with right so yeah, like yeah. um like i've seen uh they still grow they still grow uh, silks in like Sufli, Greece, and in parts of Turkey, um, where they would have grown silks in Byzantine times. Uh, Sufli, Greece has been used for silk since the Byzantine times. Um, they're not exactly doing it with traditional methods anymore. I think they can, but I've never been able to actually get in touch with them to talk to them about um, sourcing silk from there. Um, but that's that that's the sort of thing I'd like to do. Um, uh, Katerina has a source for Turkish cotton um, now, and she's dyeing, uh, she's making, my my socks are indigo dyed, and they're made in Russia, 
Um, so it's a, it's a replica of a pair of Egyptian socks. It would be nice to have it made in Egypt, but I don't know. I don't have contacts for Egypt <laughs> that can do it. Um, yeah, it, yeah, that, that's, you know, so I have contacts in Uzbekistan for, um, for, you know, metal, not, not silverware, but replica silverware, which would be made in brass or copper. Um, and I have some contacts for, uh, for, you know, some blacksmithing work, uh, some ceramics, um, mm -hmm. But you know some of the bigger things like like you know swords and and big tunics and things. You kind of want to go to people you know will do a a good job with the historical mm -hmm. sources um, from that from from there. Just just because mm -hmm. they're bigger orders, yeah, because they're more visible. Yeah, like uh, ordering a clay cup. Like if you can send them a picture in rough dimensions, and if it's not perfect, it doesn't really matter. Because because it's ceramics, there's plenty of variability in. in yeah, there's ceramics. a shit ton of variation in ceramics. Um, uh, compared to something like, I need this specific hilt, uh, yeah. at these dimensions, <laughs> um, or or the like, in this specific blade shape. Um, especially when you get to something like oak shots, late medieval swords, which mm. to be fair, that's, that's, that's Western European smithing at least. Um, so, you know, it's not a big deal with authenticity. Like I've got some shops saved on Etsy, which are Turkish and they make, uh, they, they make, uh, Byzantine S graffitos, uh, graffito repl replicas. So that's where you, um, have two layers of clay, basically clay slip and, the top layer is scratched off to reveal the bottom layer, which creates the pattern. And that's what all those dishes of like Digena's Acritus, which is the sort of uh, 13th century Byzantine epic warrior, kind of like um, like uh, 1001 Arabian Nights more than anything else, I'd say. Uh, all the dishes showing him fighting the dragon or fighting the wolf or whatever um, with his standard and everything uh, are made. And there's... Um, there's places in Turkey that actually try to replicate that, um, which is a bit later than what I usually do, since I'm more of a 10th century guy rather than a 12th or 13th century guy when uh, when Scraffito actually starts coming in. I've got those places listed so like I can start maybe ordering earlier pottery from them, because um, right now I'm having it all made by a local woman named Robin White, and she does amazing work, absolutely amazing work. But, you know, having it here made in America lacks an air of authenticity about it, especially when it's being made from, uh, like, if you can actually, like, have it made in Turkey, they're probably using local clay. Mm. Um, you know, they're using local clay sources, or more local ones, at least, um, mm. which adds its own layer of authenticity since it's actually being made with dirt that they would have used to make clay back then. And obviously that's something that's a lot easier with pottery or even... Um, arguably clothing than something like steel where um it is possible to source ore from a roman mine um but it's hard to do that and it's expensive mm. to do that yeah because yeah. especially at that point you're actually having iron bloomed and then you're looking at five thousand dollar price points for whatever you're making <laughs> uh, yikes <laughs> yeah um it is a big yikes and this this discussion has come up a lot too because there's also the question of like particularly with clothing and weaving in particular, what you can have things hand woven today. And while that adds an air of authenticity in one respect, it loses one as well because modern hand weavers, I don't, I have never heard of any who can actually get the density of material and weave that a historical garments tend to be made of. And while with machine woven clothing, you can get that easily. And I've talked to a bunch of people about this, particularly in the Viking community, where that 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 is technically a problem. And so you're 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 gaining uh with either of those machine versus hand woven, you're trading off an aspect of authenticity for another. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have no experience with hand woven textiles at all, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, it's it is as yet something I have. Uh, to explore it it's unlikely to be something i will be looking at in a big big way i've got hand loomed things which is a little bit different because they're using a, um, a you know it's not quite the same as hand woven i don't think but, uh, it's something i know that much about mm -hmm. um but um it's unlikely to be something i'll i'll seriously consider pursuing um simply because i use a lot of patterned um pattern textiles for yeah. what i need 
and no one's gonna hand weave that you know it's, yeah it's, not 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 yeah. uh, not unless you're willing to pay exorbitant prices we're talking like uh, matter matter starts hers at like 4400 euro and yeah, for something it's, like it's, it's yeah for, for for actual coptic tunics where you're having people weave this stuff on two and a half meter looms uh you're looking at prices at like for something really decorated like that you're looking in the thirty thousand dollar range like a meter so <laughs> it, it's it's it is exorbitant um yeah. i guess this brings it though the the re- limitations of reconstruction and experience because we're talking about what does authenticity mean what does immersion mean uh what limits that and but do you want to take like a before we get into this this next question do you want to hit the bathroom take water break something like that uh i give me 30 seconds to fill my water cup up yeah, yeah okay yeah yeah so i cannot believe you guys microwave your water when you're making tea like what what the hell is that people do that I heard Americans did that. Do you use the kettle? I don't drink tea. I throw it into the harbor where it belongs. <laughs> it walks right into that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I seriously don't drink tea. I, the... you're, you're keeping that bit, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, no, I seriously don't drink tea. It's just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't appeal to me. I don't like the taste. So we left off. I, I, we were moving in because we were just talking about authenticity and immersion and limitations of reconstruction experience. Another issue, I think, because I know you've talked about, so your group as a small group has worked much more closely with academia than someone like, I don't know, uh, Regia, for example, which is a big Viking era group, right? What, what, what do you feel like is the value of having a close relationship with academia versus maybe taking a less academic approach and going with large numbers is, is it just like a matter of setup and presentation uh be having people uh for the value of large numbers being having the people to do setup and presentation with an array of displays and interests and the like or is there more value to taking a more academic approach and Especially, uh, I mean, obviously we both have a very biased opinion since yeah, exactly. uh, I want, to, I, <laughs> I, I am trying to move into the world of academia very slowly, but uh, I am moving in that direction as I work towards a PhD and um, incorporate this into directly into academic research um, mm-hmm. while you are coming and filling in a gap uh, in the study of Central Asia that that has existed for a long time. And I just, so am I in many ways. Um, Cause the, there have been Byzantine groups before me. Um, it started in Australia um, of all places. So with Peter Raftos and uh, Peter Beats and Timothy Dawson um, is where Byzantine reenactment effectively started in Australia. And, but uh, you filled in a gap with uh, that exists in the world of central Asian uh, material, cultural, uh, studies oh i absolutely have not no 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 no. i'm not an academic i'm not brave enough for academia um i uh <laughs> you, you got the reference there right? yes <laughs> um so i am not an academic i i have no in the, I, I do not pretend to be one um I, I i don't aspire to be one um and i'm not filling in any academic gaps all i do is i read other people's research and i and i you know represent them maybe with my own insights here and there um in a more digestible format for the average you know non-academic person that, that that's all i'm doing um and none of what i do is primary research at least it doesn't intend to be primary research anyway mm-hmm. um and i and i don't intend on breaking into academia either um i don't have an academic career um so for, from my point of view i don't have any um anything to gain personally from that and you know what little insights i do have here and there i just share them informally with people in the field and it's like mm-hmm. yeah okay this 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 will do here and there um no i i i i'm not filling a gap at all but you know yeah <laughs> yeah well funny. i guess what i'm getting at though is that you and i both are filling in a gap in the sense that we are actually it, it's the same gap experimental archaeology fulfills um where you know academics debated for 
decades what how Lorica Segmentata was actually constructed, even after they actually found the core bridge board. Um, because <laughs> uh, and then uh, it wasn't until the Ermine Street Guard actually built the damn thing and told Russell Robinson and Peter Connolly, "Hey, uh, Robinson's reconstruction doesn't work right because it has." these like horrible issues with back mobility or something like that i can't remember exactly with what what it was because that was after corbridge was found um Hmm. and they they figured out if you take the plates and arrange them this way which still matches with how it was found it 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 actually fucking works um uh the 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 curious actually works right and uh so that that led to i think Connolly's uh construction which has just become the standard basically since then um but um that that's more so what i'm getting at where it's like you and i uh, me so far and uh you uh, as sort of like just have Im- very impromptu filled in a gap um where we are not intending to be academics but we are doing our own research that does contribute to the field and fills in a okay, gap yeah, 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 that yeah. um exists in the in the world of uh experimental archaeology or uh central asian studies or in my case byzantine studies um uh maybe um it it depends so um in so uh there's very good studies on on uh, pre-islamic um central asian costume Mm -hmm. and i i I don't really have much to add there, to be honest with you, other than maybe updating it with some more recent finds that have, you know, come to light since being published, or, or um, you know, actually just figuring out, oh, this fits really nicely, or oh, this this doesn't fit well at all. Well, I mean, it's actually, also an issue yeah. of, in, in your case, because the the research I see you do is I I found looking at what you, the the way you're taking artwork and cuz I know you take a very different approach from most reenactment groups mm, um, yeah. and so and I've started taking that approach more because I'm working with something with much more limited archaeology like you um well uh, you don't exactly have limited archaeology uh in the same way I do but um to some degree but um we're both working heavily with our artistic works and you are your ability to take costume and put it into better context or to put art into better context based on what we know from either academic research or uh, archaeology is um, a big contributing element of what you do, I've found. Yeah, so it's less doing new research and more like, you know, recontextualizing old research and, and recontextualizing the primary sources. And yeah, you're completely correct, is, is, is I work primarily from artwork and then what I do is I look at the archaeology and I find specific small findings to match to the artwork, um, as opposed to what a lot of reenactors do, where they um, collect um, a big list of finds and they'll assemble them together. Um, yeah, yeah, well, it, it's different. So I've seen that I've seen that approach where they collect a big list of finds and assemble them. Uh, I've seen that as a common approach done by um, late Roman reenactors and, and sort of the early medieval migration period reenactors. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, from my point of view, I don't like doing that. You know, I, I I can do that. I have enough finds to be able to do that. Um, but if you know, if you have the the image of what it's meant to look like and and you can debate how realistic the paintings are and 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 there there are debates in this um you can debate that um but if you have the, the, an image of what it's supposed to look like then really you start from that in my opinion and you just look at the finds and slot them in where they fit in the paintings that's mm-hmm. that's my approach to it um i don't know how much that differs from from what you're doing um well my my issue I when you work with Middle Byzantine, that's not that, that that's basically how you can do it, um, to a large degree, um, because while there is stylization in many aspects, obviously we've never found an actual riveted uh banded scale or laminar, whatever whichever of which you want to call the Byzantine style armor. Mm-hmm. Even if we've never found one, we can still uh, uh, basically put things into that context, slap them into the artistic content uh context, um. When you start getting into late Byzantine, where everything is becoming uh, armor and stuff is becoming very not only just very stylized, but has specific like symbolism with like things from ranging from Christian themes to like actual themes of Turkish resistance, and you start seeing stuff like that in Christian art, 
and um, that influences art, obviously. And obviously you have that case in Sogniana too, where stuff is influencing the art, but it, it's not the same exact situation. Um, no, and, and in general, um, Sogdian art tends to be, I mean, Sogdian art tends to be, in my opinion, fairly realistic, um, because the finds tend to back it up. Yeah, um, and art, you know. Byzantine, at least particularly provincial art, tends to as well, I've found, um, for the most part. Um, there are things that they like to do, they hate putting, uh, they hate showing like anything on the arms more than clothing. Uh, they they don't like depicting arm and leg armor. Or they don't like covering the face. Um, so some things get changed. Like um, shields are usually downsized to show the body. Uh, helmets are usually they th we don't know if they had nasals or not because they they they're always depicted to expose the face. Hmm. And um, so the the there are nuances of art that are difficult. Um, but for the most part, it's a similar situation where we can take finds and kind of slot them in, which is uh, more or less what I've done with Middle Byzantine. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, what do you, what do you feel like? Because I know you work directly with academics more, um, even more so than I do. Because my my working with academics isn't so much for reenactment as um, a handful of papers I'm working on. I find most people, like most people in Byzantine studies, do not know me, or and especially do not know that uh, Byzantine reenactment exists. Or if they do know it exists, they have a very preconceived notion of it based on uh, elite Varangian uh, leather <laughs> lamellar guardsmen. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, so I know personally, and I'm, and I'm actually close friends with um, several of the um, directors and archaeologists um, working in the field, um, and they've seen me in my gear um, at conferences. Um, so that that's nice. Um, th I find that the Central Asian Studies scene is actually very open um, and very welcoming. Um, Reenactment is completely new there, and I know that in in European history academics tend to have a fairly negative view of reenactors um, yeah. but because reenactment is, is a brand new thing for Sogniana um, and I'm kind of setting the bar really and I like to think I've set the bar fairly high you know I'm, I might not have I might be totally missing the mark but I like to think that um, you know so so uh, the, the reception has been over, overwhelmingly welcoming um, from 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 these uh, from 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 folks in the scene um, yeah, so I, I've been to three conferences now. No, four conferences. Two, uh, three of which were in gear, uh, which was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, and I, I, you know, I do intend on um, working closely with the um, the the uh, Uzbek Cultural Legacy Project. Um, so I, you know, I work closely with with those guys as well, and I've done a, a conference uh, with them in Tashkent. It was done virtually, which was fun, and it's on my YouTube channel mm -hmm. if anyone's interested. Um, but yeah, so because it's it's so welcoming, it kind of just you know it draws you more into it, and um, you get you, you get sources you know before they're published and and and, and that kind of fun things like that and mm -hmm. and people will give you feedback and they'll send you pictures and stuff and it's just it's just it's a really friendly environment it's a really nice environment and because it's fairly small um people tend to know each other and um yeah it, it it's great I, I have nothing bad to say about it actually I, i'm not and I, because i'm not in the thick of it i'm not actually sitting in universities writing stuff or, or excavating stuff i might have a different view of of it from you know not, not the outside but as a relative outsider you know mm -hmm. yeah i mean obviously as you said reenactment has a very negative reputation um in the field of western i i'd say i would say roman is not as bad as something like viking and academia or civil war in academia <laughs> but um yeah <laughs> even then it's still pretty rough especially after and uh, uh, for for my viewers out there, I hope to have Stilico on the show, and we can talk more about um the challenges of uh a big actually an actual big funded reenactment project with like the intention of permanent employees and stuff in uh in the near future uh, after the fail uh, the ob objectively the failure of the the Living Danube Blinds project to deliver a on what it was proposed and supposed to do 
which has set up a tourism corridor using reenactors as, as employees at historic sites like Carnuntum, just hmm. like you would at Jamestown here in the United States, hmm. um, which was European Union funded multi million dollar project that got squandered by academics. Um, right, I see. <laughs> and that, that, so when stuff like that happens and it strains a relationship that is already strained at best. Okay. See, uh, I mean, as far as I'm aware, there's no um, plans to do any sort of living history in Uzbekistan or Tajikistan in a big way, anyway. That, you know, um, so and and even if there were, um, it's not something that I would fall out with academics over. If that makes yeah. sense. I, yeah, and th that that brings up to where um, I guess we can uh, start looking towards wrapping this up with uh, this topic of where it's going um sure where, where the reenactment world is going because it, it's obviously changed a lot especially after 2020 yeah, um yeah because yeah, 2020 has ended a lot of things permanently i would say um not just in terms of event venues but also um and, and reenactment groups but also a lot of habits and reenactment are going to need to change because a, a lot of i feel like a reenactment has been set back many steps um, in terms of where uh, events and like growing groups, managing groups, all sorts of uh, aspects, but also in terms of the world has rapidly evolved more and more. It's, it's being pushed more and more onto the internet with yes, 2020. Yes, yeah. um, you look at say the world of music and where is music blowing up now? It's on TikTok. If you want to, if you want to get famous, you go on TikTok now, uh, and you get vi and you go viral because uh, you make you make music that everyone likes, and it goes viral, and it gets used as like little sound bites on TikTok, and that's how bands are blowing up now, or individual artists particularly. Bands are dying out, and reenactment. A lot of reenactors are trying to go that route. Obviously, you and I both have Patreons. I have a YouTube. You have a YouTube. Um, there are some very successful YouTube channels by some individuals that many in the historical uh, community would consider questionable in terms of the educational value of what they provide or, or their interpretations even, even if they are trying to be very educational. Um, their methods and interpretations are might be questionable. I'm not going to name any names for the sake of decency, I guess, politeness. But the internet is certainly changing reenactment there's obviously a desire to monetize reenactment because it is an expensive hobby. I have a feeling I might be guilty for starting the trend on that one. <laughs> I would not say you are because you have people like, and I'm going to use an example here, Dimicator, uh, Roland Wachesa. I um, suppose he was on Patreon long before I was on Patreon. Yeah, and okay, he's fine. he is one of the few people that is actually has like a large profitable Patreon. There's maybe like three or four people in reenactment that do. In the actual world of reenactment. So like Roland Borchesa, um, David Stribney, also known as Thomas Blasati, um, he makes about half as much as uh Roland does. Um there's maybe a handful of others that have very successful, very profitable uh YouTube channels, a handful of which are actually of good quality, maybe. Um hmm. Knight Errant on YouTube, run by Ian Laspina, is actually a very high quality channel. Um there's a lot I can't really disagree with him on because he's working directly with people like uh, Robert McPherson or Tobias Capwell or the like. Um, so these are like the leading experts in late uh, uh, late medieval uh, armor and weapons and military history. So like that that's an example of one where he's actually successful and he's doing what he's doing well. Um, you have smaller time guys like um was it the welsh viking or and there's like um an irish viking guy where the they they take a very historical approach as well a pretty good very historical approach they have relatively nice youtube channels with subscriber counts and maybe like the tens of thousands like say thirteen thousand sixteen thousand something like that hmm. um so they're doing okay but like they are not at a point where they can make money off of it to be self-sustaining like someone like Skalagrim or Skola Gladiatoria even 
you, you know, like Skull, you've got people like Skullagrim or Shad and uh, Shad Diversity, and I'm not going to comment on them particularly here. That's another discussion for another time, where they're actually doing reenactment adjacent, let's call it content, and sure. have large subscriber counts and that kind of thing. And then you've got like YouTube channels which are a populist history channels that do the same sort of thing like uh i'm not sure how big something like kings and generals is but that that's a big one and where they're at the point where they can not only make enough for themselves but pay a production team or that kind of thing right or at least like one or two production people at the very least um and i feel like the internet is going to change things with reenactment um in part because of that, and um, where you're going to see more and more people trying to fund the hobby themselves with various means of crowdfunding it, um, either through YouTube or Patreon. Or, I mean, I've thought myself about, man, if I could get a GoFundMe going, maybe, and uh, you know, I could get like a Byzantine tent. You know, that that's like a two thousand dollar investment. And, like, at some point, I'll have to buy one anyways. But, like, you know, with me going back to a master's degree and moving out and having to pay real bills soon, you know, that, that goal becomes less and less achievable um, in, in, a, in a smaller time span that it needs to be to really get a group going. Um, so, like, you know, you've got people looking at stuff like GoFundMe even for reenactment. And I mean, if you can convince people to donate to a border wall, I'm sure you can get it to work. But um, <laughs> so Internet is changing it in that way. I also feel like part of it is a platform thing because we mentioned earlier right now, reenactment is really heavily on Facebook hmm. and reenactment has always kind of lagged behind the times with the platform it's using. And I guess part of that is because it's a largely older crowd, as again, yes. we talked about earlier. But it's people in their 50s and 60s, and that that's what Facebook's user group now mostly is. People our age largely are not using Facebook. Correct. They have moved yeah. on to Snapchat and TikTok and Instagram. Even Instagram and Twitter are kind of like outdated for the people in the young age group now. People like just below my age who are like 22, 21, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think you're a little bit younger than me because uh, I do not use TikTok and, <laughs> you know, I or, have or one. Snapchat, so. I, I mean, um, I don't have Snapchat. I have a TikTok and an Instagram, um, neither of which are exactly successful. Uh, I think um, I know Instagram has recently changed. So it's no longer I, a photo sharing app. It's now a, um, I've forgotten what it is. But it's anyway, more, there, there's it's a big issue with a bunch, there's, there's a bunch of photographers. Um, leaving instagram and yeah. migrating to twitter so twitter's great i really enjoy it um, but there aren't many reenactors on there um, yeah i struggle a lot more on twitter than i do on something like facebook um other way around for me like facebook i can get a post with like 100 200 likes because it goes through the reenactment com- the roman community because everyone's on facebook um twitter I, I'm lucky to get like 12 like if, if <laughs> i get a good day is like six likes on a post on twitter um, right. A really damn good day is like 12. Every now and then I'll leave a comment under something somewhere. And it's like it gets 112 likes, but it's like <laughs> me saying, oh, uh, well, this politician is a fucking idiot. Um, that that so like it, it doesn't really it, it doesn't really actually contribute to my Twitter and his presence Facebook. and its following. Right. Just people agreeing. Yeah, that guy's a buckethead. Um, <laughs> Not really what we're after when it comes to. Um, the reenactment profile you know and uh, twitter is where i'm really connecting with academics more i will say that and i've got academics who are supportive of what i'm doing if not necessarily directly involved um i've talked to a few locally uh, especially now that i'm doing byzantine it's started to take notice ironically in the early islamic community like there's uh, Dr. Rana McCaddy, I believe I pronounced that correct, at uh, College of Charleston, who's like, yeah, I'd love to have you come down uh, for like my early Islam class next time I teach it. And like, you know, because I, I, one of the things on my to get list is a seventh century kid as well. Um, hmm. Do like seventh or eighth century. Hey, um, you can match. Nice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, th- there you go. But no, you've, uh, I've got places like, you know, and they, they're, they're interested more in having 
someone who can because i guess like islamic military equipment is just as bad as like a central asian because a lot of that work is still like from david nicole kind of like you were working with right and uh, so yeah, yeah yeah it's not something i've looked into or have any intention of looking into just yeah it's it's not really relevant to what i do you know mm -hmm. that, that side of things yeah or well i mean it's not relevant until you start getting into the early islamic con conquest of uh sogdiana but no, um not really i mean as far as i can tell all the stuff in sogdiana is primarily sogdian you know the yeah no 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 i i know what you're saying um, yeah 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 so but, um, I, you know knowing the Umayyad and Abbasid, you know, like West Asian stuff, not that relevant. I, I, you know, I might, I might be making like a complete idiot of myself here, but you know, it, I haven't seen it being that relevant for for what I need anyway. Well, in my case, um, so with what I'm talking about is a few early Islamic scholars have really taken an interest, um at least in my perspective on things because um byzantine is islamic adjacent and it's a bit better studied in terms of the military side of things hmm. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. even if those studies are outdated for the most part now um but like sixth and seventh century in particular are very very well archaeologically evidenced um for like south europe byzantine uh balkans um even parts of North Africa. So it's it's very much relevant to people who are studying the beginning of Islam and the Islamic world um, to a certain degree. So I get a lot, I get more response from them. And I, I, I in general, I guess, get more response from late antiquity people than actual Byzantinists. Because if you look at someone like Peter Saris, uh, like a prominent Byzantinist like him, they're, they're, they're practically never commenting on anything I do. Well, the people who are are like sixth century scholars like Connor Waitley or Michael Edward Stewart or early seventh century uh, Islamicists like uh, Rana Makati or uh, I've had some interactions with like Dr. Stephanie Mulder and a few others. So, you know, in terms of working with academia, Twitter has been the better platform, um, especially as trying to become an academic. In terms of, and obviously there's academia.edu now, um, which is really useful for us as being actors more so than we are useful to the people on there. But um, <laughs> yes. So the internet is certainly changing things. Um, but I think where I was getting with all of this is that it looks like reenactment is going to have to move off Facebook soon. And I'm not sure where we're going to go from Facebook because we need, the, the internet is moving on from long form posts, let's call it. So like, and that that's mostly what we're working with because the people, well, the reason we're still using Facebook as a platform is because it supports more than 240 characters and four images. Um, Although you do get to post Twitter threads, which is what, what I tend to do when I'm writing uh, yeah. long form content on there. But it's still not great for debates or it, 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 the, yeah, the, it's, as a setup, um, it is not great for long form content. Instagram has... Sucks. room for it i mean <laughs> it yeah so it bad. sucks in many ways but it has room for like you can put more than 240 characters in a description at least but the issue with instagram is that like it's terrible for debating because it's not like you can attach a, a photo to a comment if you're and talking you can't about use it on the theology. computer either it, you've got to be, you, you've got to use it from a phone yeah that it's, that's uh, also yeah. a big issue where we're mostly a pc based crowd with what we're doing because we don't have enough fucking room on our phones to store like 10 gigabytes of papers <laughs> but um so yeah there's obviously a big technology issue that's about to come up and i'm not sure if it's going to be discord which i i mean i just invited you to yeah or this not. is my first time on discord so uh, yeah because um sc the sca has a discord group a pretty sizable discord group now and um the harnish fecton so hema historic european Mar martial arts uh, armored fighting community has a very sizable discord presence now but, like, reenactors really have yet to move on to Discord. Discord's always been, like, a gaming sort of thing. Um, hmm. And it's great for modding, a lot of gay mods. So you get a lot of historical reenactors and historical, like, people um, in the world of video game mods for on Discord. Um, because they're, they're doing, like, advising to, like, make the, the Crusaders or the Romans or whatever more accurate for... Sure. Rome Total War, Bannerlord, or whatever. 
So there, and the other issue with fa uh, Facebook and these platforms is they hate the sale of weapons, and obviously, as reenactors, we're selling, we're we're buying and trading and selling uh, stuff that you know you put sword in your post and it gets deleted. Um, let alone people like World War One and World War Two reenactors, where a lot of them are using functional firearms. Um, hmm. Uh, at least in the United States. Um, I can't speak for Europe. In the United States, a lot of them are using functional firearms, just not loaded, um, or with the ball, or they've got like uh, part of the action taken out. So I don't think we do that here. So yeah, um, when it comes to buying and selling weapons, we're gonna have to go to back channel, like sort of ways of doing it. And it's like, what, well, where the hell are we gonna go? Um, because Facebook now, you put anything with sword in it, we can't even sell, like, if we put fetter in our post for HEMA, so a fetter is a specifically a fencing sword, it is not, like, a weapon, it is a, a, a sword designed to bend that you can fence with, just like a fencing foil, it's just shaped like a historical sword, it's usually based on a historical fetter in shape, because there were historical fetters, like when you were looking at like 17th century, 16th, late 16th, 17th century sources, I believe mostly, um, where you start seeing actual fencing fetters in these sources rather than them fencing with sharps, um, because you know fencing was for dueling, people killed each other in blood duels, and you we can't we can't sell a fencing uh, like a HEMA like if we want to just uh, sell off our starter stuff to a new guy who's just starting up in HEMA and can benefit from it and can get it used. Because unlike reenactment, it's a lot easier in HEMA since stuff tends to be a bit more standardized um, mm -hmm. since we're all using like SPES jackets and AF masks. And like our, our, our foils are pretty much universal since there's not a big thing of going for historical accuracy, uh, at least not in that area, that part of HEMA. Um, there is, but there isn't. Um, it's more complicated since we all know we're using competition grade stuff. So, in terms of a platform, Facebook has become effectively obsolete for that. Like, I can't sell shit on Facebook anymore. Even to the SCA people, I can't sell a hat to the SCA people. And it's not because it gets banned by Facebook, but it's also because Facebook's algorithm is terrible for it now. Um, yeah, Facebook is very much. It. it I'm not gonna say it's, it's very pay to play, but it, it, you know, anytime I post a Patreon link on Facebook, it gets zero engagement because it, I, I I know that Facebook does nerf Patreon links. Um, yeah, which is frustrating <laughs> because it you know th there's there's a potential good source for traffic there, but I don't want to pay for ads, you know. And its algorithm now is all like geared towards its own big Facebook marketplace thing rather than people actually buying and selling in groups. Yeah. So in yeah. terms of um so for for people like us who are dealing in a very niche market, when I post a hat to the SCA it gets buried in like two minutes and <laughs> um to the SCA group. And it's like it's a hat, it should sell pretty quickly to any of the S SCA people, and that's not meant as an insult to SCA people at all. It's just like, you know, they don't have the same goals as us. But sometimes someone just likes the look of a hat, and it's like, oh, I've got a Roman persona. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the, I'll buy your hat. So, yeah, so Facebook's algorithm for what we do, like, the fundamentally, on a fundamental lev level, it's set up for, in terms of debating and research, is still good. Hmm. But yes, I agree there. It's set up for actual, like, buying and selling and communication and getting uh, like getting word out about your group and what you do is awful, particularly now. It was much better, say, four years ago. Four years ago, it was great. Like 2016, yes. okay. 2017, yeah. yeah, four or five years ago, it was pretty damn great. Now, no, it's 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 awful. And I still think the the groups function is actually pretty good on Facebook. And yeah. So, and so, like, like this is where the differences between our certain reenactment scenes really shines so uh, i i do frequent the various Ro roman uh, reenactment groups and yeah. there's always a lively discussion it may not be particularly good but there is always a lively discussion and there's a big community of people there you can bounce ideas around with um on the other hand i, I know that there, there's a sogdians group on facebook as well and, and the chinese as well and uh, a bunch of other central asian ones yeah 
Uh, yeah, but you know, the Sogdians group is very different. It's, it's usually me going, hey, I found this cool thing in this paper. Here's a link. You know, it's yeah. very different. That's like the Avar reenactment group or the Hun reenactment group as well. Yeah, it, it, it's quite academic, but the, the, that reenactment community isn't there. And Facebook has got that community um, sense behind it, especially with the bigger reenactment teams like, like the Vikings, the Romans, where, okay, you know, you might not know everything there is to know about scale armor, but you're a super genius in um, weaving technology. And somebody else knows everything there is to know about helmets and somebody else knows everything about shoes. And, yeah. and you're bringing all this together and everybody benefits from it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, whereas, you know, obviously with, with smaller scenes, that doesn't happen so much. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I often, I've often said, man, I'm, I'm not really an academic. I'm just a product of Facebook's reenactment hive mind, because um, <laughs> I really am. But uh, the uh, serious imposter syndrome there. Sorry. Well, you actually are an academic. You're, you're working on a. Well, I, yeah. I, I, I technically am becoming one. Yes, yeah, slowly. But um, yeah. So it's, it's an interesting question of what reenactment is going to do as the internet changes. I feel like there's going to be a lot more revolving around these attempted monetized sources, particularly YouTube. Um, yes, which I am completely in favor for. I definitely think reenactors should get paid. But um, it's – yeah, and I, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second here because okay. I want to talk about that. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, uh, we, I want to close out talking about that topic. Uh, and it, it's a matter of where are we going for platforms for communication as Facebook dies because it's dying and it, it's been dying for years fundamentally. Um, it's been great for us until their algorithms changed. And I guess under the Trump administration was a lot of their algorithms changed in response to that uh, and how like it does because it, it's, it's all – it's it's all uh, their algorithms uh, promote confirmation bias and stuff, and that the, that the way they do work doesn't just apply to something like politics. It applies to a lot of different things. True. Um, true. It, it it um it's it's really affected us heavily. Um, I mean, I'm not sure it's effect. I mean, I personally haven't seen the effect. I've seen the effect on 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 my page. The error yeah, I've seen it biggest on pages. Um, for sure. But when it comes to the actual discussions that I'm having with academics and other reenactors, I haven't really noticed a major decrease in the quality of those conversations or or quantity of those conversations. Yeah, um, uh, but again. Like I said, I, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm on the fringes of the reenactment scene. I, I'm really not in the thick of it. And because of what I do, um, I'm working with a much smaller crowd of people. Um, you know, so, so my experience is, is not typical. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll gladly go by your, um, by well, what I'm referring to is like exactly what you're talking about. Basically, it's like, yeah, we, we stay in our same community and we, we have really no issue finding our discussions and stuff there. But what about people? discovering our community from outside and the, the, yes. the algorithm yeah. is limiting us off from everyone else right yeah and, and, and see, that's, that's why pages where... are doing poorly that's why we're not getting that's why exactly. you don't get new people coming up to your page or your youtube or whatever through your page um exactly and and to be honest that's where i think twitter does a lot better um like i i go through growth spurts on on, on twitter um and I've been in a bit of a lull recently because I've just not been posting. I've been stuck at like know. 800 followers for four years, so go figure. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but no, I find that that like getting posts viewed and reached on Twitter, I tend to have more luck with that. Um, but but like your your experience is the complete opposite of mine. Yeah. Um, we can all agree that Instagram sucks. Um, so you know, mm -hmm. I, it uh, sucks unless you have boobs. Yeah. And the, the, or, it's, or you're selling something. I, do, I don't. Yeah, that. Like, I I don't want to try and be sexist with that, but Instagram has moved a lot more to accommodating. Uh, like it's got like stories, right? And Twitter's got added fleets, and Facebook's got its own stories now. And um, it's accommodating a lot more of that type of content of of people who are very egocentric and want a very large they they are actively trying to they are very egocentric people already very co prominent in whatever community they are part of uh cosplay was the example basically i was thinking of and mm -hmm. um those people have a very particular personality where they are constantly trying to get self gratification from other people through their appearance and other things 
and that's what Instagram is very much catering towards yeah, uh, in so. many Although, ways. Honestly, like my Instagram feed is mostly bunny photos. So uh... mine's like all reenactment stuff. Yeah, <laughs> um, like a handful of cosplayers that I like, and like ninety nine percent reenactment stuff. Um, it's it, it's all bunnies and birds and animals for me. That, yeah. that that's it. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's, uh, um, it's yeah. And like TikTok is uh basically the best platform to break out on right now, and it's because of the way that. And this is not coming from me. This is coming from a dude named Charlie who does uh production for Eckhart's Ladder. But apparently, like the deal with YouTube, Twitch, and TikTok right now. It's, it's a matter of how long it takes for someone to decide whether or not they like your content and the placement of ads. Because uh, Twitch, it takes like 15 minutes of watching a stream to for someone to determine whether or not they like your content and are going to subscribe and keep watching you. Um, and the problem with that is that with Twitch is putting like 30 second ads and like one minute ads at the beginning of these streams. And that all it, that's all it takes for like just a few sec the the instant you go to a stream and that people ad leave. pops yes. up yeah people just they they leave um I tiktok was the same with youtube actually until it got so bad i ended up paying for youtube premium and it's it, it's great now uh but like previously before i just paid for the youtube premium i was getting an ad every three minutes i'm like this is yeah. not a usable platform. and it's better it's better with ad blockers a lot of people use ad blockers now yeah, and so but youtube here's the thing. Like, like, does you, better because of, of the that time when i'm listening to youtube I just have it like I'm not watching it. I'm just listening to it like in the car while I'm driving, and like you know the, the screen is it's like chucked on the passenger seat, and I just have it running on autoplay. Um, but when the, when the ads come on, it's just like it's it's infuriating, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the with YouTube, once you get to like a certain point, you can start choosing where ads pl get placed in the video, or if you get yeah. sponsored, obviously that's that's a big deal that, uh, that allows the, you to fix you know, that problem. I, I, I don't think a lot of creators do that. I think a lot of creators just go for the auto option. Um, yeah. But it, it, I don't know what they do. But in any case, but it's still it, not it as bad. bad you know? It's not as bad for Twi as Twitch streamers because the way people browse YouTube. They're usually going on like these. They the, the, they discover people by going on quote unquote deep dives where they fucking browse on YouTube for like three hours at two a.m. like looking up the history of cheese or whatever, and they find people that way. So YouTube does better, a lot better than Twitch, and it's 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 still a between YouTube and Twitch, it's by far the better platform to try and break out on. Um, sure. And then TikTok, TikTok takes like two or three seconds for someone to determine whether or not they like your content. That okay. so it's it's super easy to break out on TikTok, um, but TikTok does not for uh, support the long form content that we do, mm -hmm. um, especially like. Well, the, there's no requirement for reenactors to do long form content. You know, there isn't. You, you you can make short, catchy videos or, or whatever. Quite and easily. there's like. There's like two Bohurt TikToks and like two Hema TikToks I follow, and that's about it. And there's mm. like there, there's people who do like these short like history TikToks where they do a short history in like 30 seconds, uh, talking about something that's like remotely relevant. And uh, because I, I I'm thinking of that because there's one example, and she gets bashed all the time for getting stuff wrong because <laughs> she does. Um, it's very popular populist history, but we're seeing that sort of open up into TikTok. Where we've got now short form populist history content creators, let's call them. So we've got like, we're starting to get like our Shadowversities and Skalagrams and Gladiatorios of TikTok. And I don't know what reenactment is going to do there, but I think there may be an opening. But the opening is a matter of like, monetization is going to be a big part of that opening because you have to be able to de deliver content practically every day and to deliver content every day like that as a reenactor that means you need to be spending a lot of fucking money on a lot of fucking things to have, constantly have new new things to deliver to your audience yes i agree yeah yeah and so um, so this kind of brings us back to, to Patreon, I think. So um, when I was setting up mine back in 2018, I think. Um, that sounds about right. The main inspiration I had for mine was cosplayer Patreon. And, and, and <laughs> a lot of cosplayer Patreon is, is, is girls wearing not that much. Yeah, I'm not, you know, it's, it's not. Well, a lot of them have moved to OnlyFans now, but yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's like whatever. But there are some cosplayers on 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 um on Patreon who actually you know make really good costumes and put a lot of effort into making sure it, it matches the character. And uh, but the thing is, um, most of them can sew, right? Which I can't do, and I yeah. don't have the time to learn. Um, and the other thing is, um, it's a little bit different because they're sort of making you know four or five six new costumes every year um and so they you know they've got something new to showcase every couple of months well now they're talking about um because i saw a cosplayer i follow um who uh, actually puts genuine genuine effort into what she does um it's not just all boobs so and she was talking about like 10 years ago it was like four five six costumes a year now the people who are being really successful at cosplay are doing four five six costumes a month jesus christ it's just we can't do that it's it's impossible you know um yeah, yeah. It, it, that's not possible we, we'd we run out of impressions to do it like, takes in a year. it's taken me two years to put together a byzantine kit and it's still not done it won't be done and it won't be ready until like almost December. And I'm worried I won't be able to have enough. I, I'm i not worried. I'm not going to be able to have a passable late Roman or principate Roman kit done in time for days of nights in October, which I'm really disappointed at right now. Um, Cause it's, it's $300 just to ship a shield from Europe. Uh, like a big late Roman shield. That's $300 in shipping. That's a massive barrier. Uh, yeah. Cause it costs as much as the damn thing itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and that that's gonna be an issue. And, and on top of the matter of just getting things done in time, because like we're in we're all in wake queues. Like the wake queue for a pair of Thorsberg trousers, on top of whatever the hell they're gonna cost to have them custom fitted to me, is like probably like two or three months right now. And October mm. is only like two months away. And that's just for when they get started. Um, my Byzantine stuff, I'm still waiting on my shield. Uh, the one that's in the U S is being painted still. It, it's still in the queue to be painted. Um, the, the larger one, the larger one is just being started. I still don't have metal armor for that kit. Um, I just commissioned it like a week ago after a very long and drawn out argument with Oleg over it. Um, and that, that's not meant to disparage Oleg, just they, they have a way they've been doing things, and I, I want things done a, a different way, um, as you well and good know. Um, there's, um, so yeah, like, you know, we can't compete with that level. No, exactly. Not no, like, without serious funding. If they're doing, you know, one costume a week, you know, we're doing one costume every... <laughs> four or five years it, it's totally different ball game so um and the good one the the, the ones with money are doing like one costume a year since they yeah, can order yeah, everything yeah. in january that, that's, that's with like their the, twenty thousand dollars and then it's all done by december that that's the upper end you know the very um, upper end the the one dude who has like 92 swords and like three suits of eighteen thousand dollar armor uh <laughs> upper end yeah yeah um i, I I don't think financially our generation is going to be able to do that ever, to be no. honest. No, with, with the exception of the handful of people who can break out on TikTok because their content somehow captivates an audience, be that through either its uh, nature, either educationally uh, and uh, just being generally somehow interesting or through yeah. like uh, sex work or whatever, which not to disparage sex work at all. Uh, you know but um if if your feet pick sell by all means like the way our generation is going no it's 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 not going to be a thing for us where we're all strong especially in america um i mean uh, 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 there's places well, worse than the uk is probably place... going to be in in as bad a state if not worse than them soon than yeah because i years. i've i've seen what minimum wage in the uk is and pay weight rates in the uk is and even adjusting for the dollar uh, the dollar to pound ratio it's pretty much at the same point the u.s is except you all have the benefit of better health care um well we did just embargo ourselves remember yes and it's <laughs> yes it's like seven months ago yeah um, um but um and obviously there are places that are worse than the u.s or the uk for doing this um a lot of the balkans struggles because the average income of someone 
in the Balkans is like four hundred dollars a month. So like mm. you know, and that that that's why they make that's why so many people over there actually can become full time blacksmiths and make stuff for us at prices we consider really fucking good because yeah. the our money our pound our euro our dollar is worth four times as much as what they're trading with in their own countries and yes. um so they can make armor at one fourth the price i'd be paying like jeffrey hildebrandt to make it or something and their top end armors are just as good and will charge much higher prices but um because they know what their shit is worth and they know currency exchange rates, but and then obviously you've got people who are trying to do the, do this in places like Argentina, um, where there's there's people trying to do Roman from Argentina now, or there's there, there's an old old reenactment group um in Jordan that does Legion Six Ferrata, and they've been I, as far as I last heard check they were been they've been struggling for like the past four years I'd say I don't know how the pandemic affected them. So obviously there's places that have it a lot worse in, try, in terms of trying to do reenactment, break into it even, uh, hmm. than we do. Um, yes. And to get back around to working with academia, <clears throat> I, I think fundamentally this is where reenactment needs to go, where it needs to change. And this is what Stilico has been trying to do, as we mentioned earlier, where it needs... Because it's a matter of not just where reenactment needs to go, but where the the history field itself needs to go too, where things are changing. Uh, universities aren't funding; they haven't been funding history departments like they used to for decades. Um, like most classics departments in the U.S. were disbanded in like the the, the early '90s. Museums aren't raking in cash like they used to uh enough to fund they they never really were making it enough to fund themselves um state support for them is diminishing so in the in the world of what we do as academics as historians museum curators archaeologists i feel like um bringing in reenactors and making it a full-time thing as like historic jamestown like a fully funded carnuntum like what if the Living Danube Limes project had been successful, what Stilico was trying to do, where you've got government funding, but also bringing in maybe funding through crowd, from crowds where they're coming into these events and buying like trinkets and whatever, or donations. Mm. Um, and you have people doing it full time, so you don't have to worry about your average Jomsborg Viking rolling up in his biker leather uh, kit and uh, mis misinforming people. So you have reenactors as employees, and you're bringing in a level expert, a new level of expertise, experience, and authenticity and immersion to these these events and true settings. And I feel like this is where it's all going to have to go. And I, 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 I want, I, do you agree with that, or do you think that there is a different way it's going to go, maybe a more spectacly route? I. The honest answer is I think we'll see two separate fields emerging um, because the spectacle will always get ticket sales. Yes. Um, and that's not going to stop. Although I suppose it will stop when people are too, uh, you know, busy or poor to, for tickets, which will probably happen within our lifetime. Um, but but that, that, you know, that's its own thing. And, and I don't do that, so I can't really speak to that, you know. Um, and then I, I think... When it comes to niche things, they'll probably be um, crowded out of the mainstream reenactment scene. In fact, I have been being crowded out of the mainstream reenactment scene for some time now. And, and that's mm -hmm. kind of what led me to sort of blaze new trails online and, and, and focus on an online thing and focus on Patreon and focus on publication and, and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, focus on the photography side of things. Um, so... Um, I don't really know what platforms will be big. I, I, stuff's going to happen on YouTube, obviously. Um, I'm sure stuff will happen on TikTok, although I'm not familiar with it at all. Um, more stuff will probably happen on Twitter as, as people, you know, join, move on to Twitter. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I definitely agree that I think there will be more crowdfunding of things in the future, which is something I'm completely in favor for mm -hmm. um, as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. But what about like employment? Uh, like seeing reenactors become full-time employees 
emerging of museums, academia, and reenactors, actors because that's that's the route. I, I, I feel like the happen. big leaders I, are trying to take. I don't it. think it's going to happen. I mean, the heritage sector is is being slashed. It, you know, it's um, um, I I honestly I don't see that happening. Um, in I mean, it it's not going to happen for me. Um, because there's nothing in the UK for me. Um, in that regard. Um, you see, and that's what I'm wondering about. Because like. You look at places coming out of the post-Soviet world trying to find their national identity, right? Um, mm-hmm. Because it's been so thoroughly erased under Soviet occupation. So, like, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, I feel like there would be a place for you that you could sort of bring it in there in a way oh, that... Oh, I definitely feel there is. I definitely feel there is. Um, but then you have the logistical issues of getting over there yeah um Unless which if i'm just taking there. myself and some soft kit that that's fine um but you know add armor and a sword and a dagger into the mix and it becomes and custom very regulations it, be- yeah, it becomes very complicated at that point um no no so so um i um i i I definitely envisage more work with the Uzbek and Tajik um, heritage sectors and the tourism boards in in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, n- n- you know, n- um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like I don't have that option in the same way. Because um, I guess Italy's been so hyped already, and it's got its own. Yeah, you know, it's Roman it's got its own Roman so. scene. Um, its own. And uh, you know, we can talk all day about that because uh, th- there's the whole thing with um. Like uh, the 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 approaches the Italians take are very different from the approaches, uh, German or Austrian or British reenactors yeah. take in many ways. Um, yeah, yeah. that's not necessarily to disparage them. Just it's it's they're, they're they are they take it as a part of their culture in a way that we do not. Yes. Um, and I guess Turkey's is main interest is with the Ottomans as opposed to the. Yeah, uh, Turkey well. has a Turkey has a, the the issue with, and this is true for Greece too. Um, where while the empire in the so-called Byzantine period was very much an Anatolian empire more so than a Greek empire, neither Greece or Turkey really have a, a particularly large amount of interest in it. There's funding for archaeological excavations, but not nearly to the extent that something like classical Greece is funded. And the reason for that is fundamentally just tourism, because that that's what brings in money to their countries. Um, and they will absolutely nuke the medieval layers to get to something from classical Greece, or if there's some sort of big like Bronze Age find in Turkey, because a lot of their focus now is on like you know connecting to like their Hittite and lo- more local empires past, sure. with, with ignoring the Romans obviously, um, <laughs> which is uh, and during the Middle Ages was a very local empire, but um, and you know obviously excluding um, some of their more political genocided peoples and their local empires like Urartu and the Armenians, um, sure. which was very much in Western Tur- or Eastern Turkey. Um, but the, you know, the, they will destroy the medieval layers to go straight to a bronze age site or particularly like if there is any chance of a big classical Greek or classical Roman mosaic down there that could bring in a ton of tourism money. Uh, and news coverage and that kind of stuff, they will a- absolutely. But that's the problem with where I have. So, like, you know, and the Turkish government does not want a bunch of Byzantine reenactors in Constantinople or Istanbul yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. for for very obvious reasons on top of, and and even under, I mean, just look at the things that have been happening under Erdogan there, right? Greece just doesn't, they don't look at it as part of their heritage in the same way because of what the British did to their heritage. Um, and uh, for those that don't know out this, I'll do an episode on it eventually on uh, Caldellus Roman land book and Roman identity and why it no longer exists, at least not in the same way it did. There are a handful of people that still call themselves Romans out there and they're very rare. Uh, in the 1820s, I'll just gloss over this real quick. Britain during the Greek uh, Revolution, in a nutshell, they basically wanted to divide up the Balkans the same way they divided up, um, like they they had their own little states in Southeast Asia that were under control, 
their control. Um, so like they wanted to basically turn Istanbul into like a little Hong Kong, and the, most of this was to curb Russian influence and the power of the Russian Empire, um, in East Europe and in uh, in the seas. Because if they could control the Bosporus Straits, that's obviously a major trade lane for the Russians. Um, anyways, but one of the things they did with in the Greek Revolution is that they absolutely wiped out Roman identity, and by ma- tying it as Ottoman complicitness. So anyone who identifies as a Roman was seen became seen as like complicit with like Ottoman atrocities in Greece and the like. And during that process, and you know, the spread and the creation, uh, the real creation of like this whole Byzantine Empire idea, because they didn't want the Greeks getting any ideas of getting their empire back. Obviously, um, the the whole Western narrative of we are the descendants of the Roman Empire, um, British colonialism, British imperialism, and I'll go into this in much more depth in a future video. Obviously, so that that just destroyed any, it, it totally destroyed interest in the the middle ages in greece basically so they they look entirely to their mostly hellenic era uh finds and stuff for their identity and so there's just not that level of interest in byzantine stuff i mean you still see it the it, it's there particularly with like constantine 11 you, the, the, there's always like statues of him being unveiled and stuff because i mean you know, the last quote unquote Greek emperor dying in combat in Constantinople is a pretty good narrative. Um, even if that's probably not what happened, he probably was beheaded in the church, which another source, source says. So, you know, it, it, there's an opportunity for you to find a heritage, uh, create a heritage, um, business, I guess, or a, a heritage program that with tourism to Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and maybe even Afghanistan if it stabilizes, which obviously with the U.S. pulling out, that's a complicated political situation, that there is not for someone like me working in the world of Byzantine studies or even in the world of Roman. And it's it's largely Germany and Austria that's interested in that kind of stuff, or Britain and, uh, and to some extent America. It's Western scholars that are become interested in it and Germany or Britain aren't going to fund uh, a bunch of Byzantine guys standing around in uh, a little reconstructed fort or whatever, you know? The, the, the UK is definitely not. The, the UK's view on, on history and heritage is very myopic to England. <laughs> yes. You know? um, and just yeah. like Americans is very myopic to America. Um, yeah, which yeah. has only existed for less than 300 years. So It, it makes reenacting at events quite unpleasant at times um but you know it's um yeah yeah if you yeah i i I wanted to talk about that in this podcast but um i can bring you back for another one in the future (laughs) and we can talk more about the experiences of um racism and the like and academia and public events and reenactment because obviously there's a lot to talk about there and Hmm. i I hate to say it, but I enjoy ripping on Civil War reenactors. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy ripping on Vikings, so we'll yeah. Find there. So there's some common ground there. So um, I guess do you want to end it here? Um, sure. Yeah, yeah. Good idea. Uh, we can just um close in remarks, I guess. Um, so I just I just wanted to say a couple of things. So um, basically, from my point of view, I've kind of almost given up on trying to have the standard reenactment experience with Mm -hmm. a group and events and whatever um and so what i'm focusing on more now is um publishing a photo book essentially of 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 reconstructions of costumes and other things from from, um from you know the fifth through till the um eighth century um, Mm -hmm. central asia um and so for this i I don't have reenactors for this because i don't have reenactors for this period at all um so what i'm actually doing is i've decided actually what i need to do is is hire models book studio Mm -hmm. space and then do it that way and Mm -hmm. it means it, it sort of means i have to source all the costumes myself um, which that's a huge is, expense it's, it's a big financial burden yeah um it, 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 it well I, I guess that is where the patreon of the crowd crowdfunding comes in and it, it's sort of essential for this this isn't a one-person job at all for funding um but you know the end product I, i'm sure will be sure will be worth it um 
that that's that that's might be a GoFundMe it. level project. Uh, like, if you can get like a budget together of basically hmm. enough, because uh, a lot of I've seen a lot of books get funded with uh, GoFundMe. I myself donated to one, um, which is a big photo book, um, on cheetahs, like the the okay. animal, um. And I got one of those out of the GoFundMe because you donate a certain level, you get a copy of the book, a signed yeah, yeah. copy of the book. Or I've seen like a few that. on Kickstarter, yeah, similar sort of things. Yeah, uh, but, so yeah. like uh, a photo book for like uh, Sogdian in Central Asia, especially like if you could get it, uh, like because that that would be something that I'm sure that the tourism industry, as you talked about over there, would really be interested in, um, even just to have it to sell in their shops. So I'm sure hmm. there's there's avenues for that, um, because I'm ta- I want to take a similar route. Um, so my master's thesis is going to be on Byzantine military equipment, hopefully, and from there it should become my next book. Because uh, yeah, as as some of you my viewers know, and of course as you know, Nadim, uh, did I ever send you a copy of my book? Uh, not yet. I will have to do that at some point. Um, consider it a reward for being on this podcast. I actually have an extra copy sitting over there, so I'll sign in and send it to you. And I've considered uh, doing a GoFundMe for to fund that because um, I'm not taking the same approach with photo book uh, reconstructions, but like Graham Sumner is an expensive artist, and mm, um, yes. and there's also a matter of um, but no, uh, I, yeah, that that's sort of how I'm maybe looking to fund reenactment maybe because uh you know youtube patreon i'm trying a lot of ideas i may even try tiktok if i can at some point uh try and break uh, you know see find a way to break in there that uh nobody's figured out yet but um uh it looks like like for you for me for our small groups finding sources of funding and that this it, could be it's, a... it's it's important yeah i mean the, the bigger groups they'll sustain themselves because they get paying events and they have membership fees mm-hmm. and the barriers to entry aren't that big and the individual work you know if there's 30 people on the field each person doesn't have to do that much work right mm-hmm. um but you know small niche things do require um more funding and, yeah. and, and more outside input um yeah yeah and it requires um for like in terms of a book my Battle of the Catalan Fields book is, uh, you know, it's not a bestseller. Um, I made a grand total of 26 euros off of it last year, and all of which went to paying to the advance. But something like uh, a book on Byzantine military equipment, or for you, a book on, like, Sogdian costumes, um, in your case, that has a wider appeal, especially with um, local culture of like uh Tajik and Uzbek communities and maybe the tourism industry over there um that could have a big appeal there um with their local history particularly because they want that national identity um, yeah and, and I think you know military history um has a fairly specific demographic yeah uh, and who like it whereas you know heritage and costume and 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 world cultures appeals to a different audience and yeah i, I think maybe a slightly broader audience you know mm-hmm. yeah because like what i'm looking for a, a byzantine military equipment book is still is going to do a lot better than something as specific as the catalonian fields uh yeah, it's yeah. going to appeal to a lot more war gamers a lot more reenactors a lot more greek and turkish history buffs because they do exist um hmm. their their governments may not exactly promote that national identity uh, that as part of their national identity but i mean it's there um so it, it's got a it's got a much more broad appeal and i hope it will do better and maybe if i'm super lucky it could sell as well as something like an osprey book and make make some money off of it um maybe not a lot but like you know if I can make like a couple hundred bucks a year, that's better than zero bucks a year, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I feel like for you and I, uh, I guess the conclusion we can reach here is that the big barrier at our level is because we're doing things in such a different way, working with academia or uh, finding different definitions of authenticity and immersion, um, experiencing reenactment in a different way as as sort of more adjacent with what we do than actually doing like normal mainstream reenactment that it, it, yeah, the challenges exactly. are a lot different um, than for a big Roman group or a big Viking group. 
and our futures as reenactors are a lot different too. Definitely, they're definitely, gonna diverge yeah, a lot yeah. more. I, I mean, I, I don't see a future for me and standard reenacting. You know, mm-hmm. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put it out there. Um, but that's not that's not to say I'm gonna stop doing it. it. Just means I'm gonna you know do it differently, mm-hmm. <laughs> which I, I think is probably the approach you'll take as well. Maybe mm-hmm. maybe not. Yeah, I, I I would like to do it with more university involvement or, or at that level. Um, and I, I, I want to keep the sort of the reenactment elements where like, you know, I want to get a bunch of Byzantine guys that I can do Byzantine drill with or late Roman drill um, since I still do fifth century. That's still one of my big interest areas, even if it um, I've sort of shifted my big focus right now. So like I still want to do a lot of that, but, you know, it, it's the barriers are, are, are a lot different at our level than yeah, they are yeah, yeah, yeah. for yeah, Viking or principate or something that's well established definitely yeah manpower and funding mm-hmm. and publicity yeah yeah and Good. employment <laughs> time is just a big thing on its own all right um speaking of time uh it was great having you nadim it was a lot of fun yeah i will bring you back in the future that's for sure uh, looking forward to it all right thanks i will see you soon i'll see you soon